Hey everyone, it's Enderman with a lower KC. Before the video begins, I just wanted to let you know that this story is set in the same universe as all these stories that you see on screen. You don't need to listen to any of these to enjoy this one, it's standalone. But if you do enjoy it, then please consider checking these stories out too. I'll put the playlist with them all in the description. Thank you. October 1st, 2039. Miles below the surface, south of the bank of Newfoundland, the deep ocean was pitch black. A void untouched by sunlight, of crushing pressure, of lonely cold, and eerie roars and rumbles and whistles heard on hydrophones. And it was here that the rusting, twisted, decaying, sad metal, steel, and iron hull of a ship could be found and light was shining on her wreck for the first time in almost 150 years. A submarine slowly propelled itself, maneuvering with care through the current over the bow of the wreck, shining bright beams of light on her deck, the only beams that pierced the darkness around her and yet at the same time seemed to not. It retreated, but the darkness outside did not give way. It pressed itself up tightly against the beams of light, as if it could force its way back into the space the light occupied, lurking always like a monster as the submarine glided over the wreck. The crew inside her were hard at work. They had found the long-lost White Star Line cargo ship, SS Naronic, and they had found her by random chance. The archaeologists and other researchers had been doing a mission to the wreck of the RMS Titanic when they essentially bumped into her. They were doing a mission to the Titanic that would serve two purposes. The first was to start the process of preparing for a new full 3D scan of the wreck to complement the one done in 2023. The reason a new 3D scan of the shipwreck was being planned was so that the state of her wreck and the rate of her decomposition could be compared to how it was now to what it had been in the 2023 3D scan of the wreck and allow scientists a better understanding of how fast the ship was decaying away. Even in two pieces and over a century old, the Titanic still proved to be worthy of her name. She was a strong old girl, a wreck, but one that seemed to withstand the harsh conditions of the ocean far better than most had anticipated. The bow section, anyway. The stern was only getting worse by the year. Nonetheless, Titanic almost seemed to still have some life in her yet. She wasn't done fighting just yet. Leading the expedition was the famous marine archaeologist Brock Ballard, who had become a near-household name the year before when he had startled everyone by discovering the wreck of a ship that almost no one thought even existed. The Orang Madan, the legendary ghost ship from the 1940s whose crew supposedly had been found all dead that most, save internet theorists, agreed never existed, had been proven to be very real. He had not only proved she did exist, but he had also found evidence in her cargo hold that a nerve agent, Tabin, was responsible for the deaths of the whole crew and that the final crew members had deliberately set a fire on the ship to sink it to keep anyone else from suffering their fate. Ballard had studied, or discovered, multiple well-known and obscure shipwrecks. The White Ship, he'd studied the Titanic before on multiple occasions. He'd found other lost passenger liners everyone thought would never be found, like the Lord Spencer and the Prince Oscar. But the Orang Madan discovery really put the world's attention on him and made him more than just a marine archaeologist to many. His book he had written about the Orang Madan after her discovery had immediately jumped to number one on multiple bestseller lists. In some cases, physical copies were in short supply. Some now saw him the same way people used to see explorers during the golden age of exploration. His insight, way of thinking outside the box, and way of looking at shipwrecks, along with his new worldwide fame, had been the reason that he was specifically asked to lead the newest expedition to the Titanic. 
Her stoutness continued to impress everyone. Her bow had appeared out of the darkness as proudly as it always did, but she, like shipwrecks, was a ruin and looked sad. But despite her strength, she was not immune to being eroded by time itself. And that was the catalyst for the second reason Brock Ballard and his team had been tasked with visiting the Titanic. It wasn't the first time Brock had seen her in person, but it was perhaps his most important visit. Despite holding out strong, the wreck was still decaying, and an opportunity had been presented. After a visit to her by another team the year before made a discovery. They had found some sections of her decks had started to collapse, and new openings had been created in the hall. From the footage the previous team had gotten the year before, it was theorized that from the size of the new openings, someone could get a small detachable ROV down into sections of the wreck that had never been accessible before. One could now get a robot deeper into the wreck than ever before, not just to passenger cabins, but into corridors with access to some of the lowest sections of the ship, and see parts of the ship that had not been seen since the night of April 15, 1912. If accessible, those areas of the ship were to be visited, studied, and photographed. It was possible some of the blank pages on the story of the sinking of the Titanic could be filled in with this new access. Due to the ongoing decay of the wreck, many theorized that there would only be a short period of time that this access to some of the deepest sections of the ship would be available. So a new expedition with the best equipment was planned and launched in 12 months to visit the wreck. Ballard and his team had gone in person to the wreck. Most of the time, Ballard preferred to use unmanned subs for deep sea exploration to reduce human risk. But, with something as delicate as what they were about to attempt in such a significant place, he wanted to be there in person for the mission. So he and his team had been there, right next to the Titanic, on the starboard side after the bridge, as the small ROVs were detached and gently sent down into the openings in the wreck. As they'd been moving into position, a sudden current pushed the sub right towards the Titanic, but a quick response from the operators prevented them from hitting the side of the ship. <laughs> Ballard had chuckled after the fact and looked over at them. Good work. There had been no other surprises, and the ROV had been deployed successfully, and it entered into the new opening in the hall, sliding down through several decks through a collapsed section. While they did get into some areas that had never been photographed since the wreck was found, there were too many hazardous sections and closed watertight doors to allow access to a lot of the areas within her guts that had been of interest. So the Titanic was still keeping some of her secrets locked away. Nonetheless, the images they saw once the little robots got inside the Titanic were haunting. Personal effects dropped and left behind. Doors standing closed or half open or fully open in some cases, chandeliers hanging from the ceiling, all things and places that hadn't been seen since the night Titanic sank, each one a little piece of the story of that night. Other pieces of that night to remember were still on the wreck of the Titanic too, if one knew where to look. The lone reeled-in lifeboat davit just after the bridge a testament to First Officer William McCaster Murdoch and the crew's efforts to save passengers and get them off the ship to the very end when the Titanic plunged down, still stood tall and somber on the starboard side deck. Ballard had stared at it in silence as the sub passed it. The little pieces like that, that told a very human story. Every time he saw it, he always thought he could hear the echoes of the screams and shouts and of the wave that washed so many of the passengers and crew, including Murdoch, off the deck and into the sea. Many of them had never been seen again after that, but the testament of their actions was still there on the wreck well over a century later. What other remnants, what other forgotten pieces of the story were still locked deep inside Titanic's hall that would never be seen? There were a lot of stories from that night that no one would ever know. The engine room was an area it was hoped that they could reach because it held a telling part of the story many had wandered about but no one had ever seen. Many historians were very curious to see where all the power switches, breakers, dynamos, and electric system controls were set to. Many wanted to see exactly the settings the engineers left everything on as they fled to the deck shortly before the Titanic went down. Since none had survived, 
Theirs was a story that had never been fully told. And how exactly they were able to keep the power on so long was still a partial mystery. If they could get inside, they could see where everything was set. Like up in the wireless room where all the switches were set on the max power settings. And see what the engineers had set everything to. What they had done to get just a little extra gasp of electricity before they left. But they couldn't reach the engine room. Despite her age, they found that the Titanic was still proving stronger than anyone expected, and she hadn't deteriorated as much as was expected. In fact, her bow in particular still looked almost as good and intact as it did a decade earlier, and her strength prevented their access. However, the team had also taken a day to visit the stern and found the opposite there. It was worse than anyone had expected. The stern section was slowly being crushed flat by the ocean. Despite that sad sight, the expedition had been overall successful, but not as fruitful as many had hoped. New sections of the ship were photographed. It was found that the bow section was still in better condition than anyone expected. And the first step towards getting a new scan of the wreck was complete with the site assessment complete. However, something else had come from the expedition to the Titanic. While their research vessel was en route to her wreck, the team had been running a scan of the ocean floor, just to see if any points of interest appeared. And one target caught everyone's eye. A massive target on the sea floor, with the telltale shape of a twisted up shipwreck that had been almost 500 feet long. It was nestled down between two large mounds of rock formations on the floor. They noted the position of the anomaly and then continued on to the Titanic. And on the way back, they had returned to see what the target had been, and that led them to discover the wreck of the missing vessel, Neuronic. They had identified her rather quickly, partially due to her shape and length, and the shape of her superstructure, but then they spotted her etched name still faintly visible on the bow, just like the Titanic's was in her own bow. The White Star Line vessel was less than 20 miles away from her more famous fellow White Star passenger liner, like long-lost family members who found one another again. By sheer coincidence, the two ships, which shared a kinship with each other due to their parent company, had been lying close to one another the entire time. Some people had theorized for years that the Neuronic was near the Titanic, but now that had been proven true by sheer chance. SS Neuronic was sitting upright on the ocean floor, her sagging bow pointing sadly to the south in the direction of the Titanic. Along her crumpled hull was catastrophic damage. A large, vicious gash in the metal that seemed like it had come from an iceberg collision. She seemed to have also sunk fast, because her remaining lifeboat davits were still reeled in, and not out like they would be if the boats had been lowered. The berg had torn a gash along two-thirds of the ship's starboard hull, and, after seeing it, Ballard estimated that the Neuronic had sunk in less than 30 minutes. And he felt that was a conservative estimate. It might have been way less. Maybe 10 minutes even. Even with her watertight compartments, Neuronic would have had no way to survive damage like she'd sustained. No ship could survive being ripped open the way she had been. Ballard was close up against the thick window of the submarine, gazing out as the sub passed above the wreck. He took in each detail that he could see with awe, humbled to know he got to be among the first humans to see the ship in over a century, and pulled out a voice recorder from his pocket and turned it on. He was glad they had the submarines that required a crew. Those were the only ones they had brought for the expedition, since they were originally only intended to visit the Titanic. Because getting to be here in person for the Discovery was impactful in a way far deeper than it would have been had they been using unmanned submarines. Here, in the crushing darkness, a little bit of light and humanity had found its way back to the ship that had long missed it. There they were, getting to see her in person for the first time anyone had in over 145 years. She seems sad, Ballard eventually said into his audio log. There's an aura about this wreck that I haven't felt before. Ships are just metal and steel and wood, but sometimes they seem to give off emotions, like how abandoned buildings can feel lonely or welcoming. Shipwrecks are inanimate objects, but 
there are times when they feel like they have emotions. Neuronic, here in the darkness. It's like she feels she failed her passengers and crew. She was lost in 1893, and her replacement, the SS Georgic, was later sunk in World War I by the same ship that also sank the Mount Temple. That's another story. Neuronic herself is resting upright on the ocean floor, a large iceberg wound in her side, slightly leaning towards her starboard side. Her bow is pointing almost directly towards the Titanic's bow, like two souls reaching out to the other for companionship in the dark. She is resting, but restless. If ever a place was haunted. Neuronic was lost just over 19 years before the more famous of White Star Line ships, the Titanic. Having seen the Titanic myself many times now, I have a feel for her. It almost to me feels like there is a kinship between these wrecks. Two White Star Line ships, almost within sight of each other, lost to icebergs, now only sad ruins on the ocean floor, shadows of what they once were, cut off from the world of light far above that marches on without them. Here they're alone, or even something as trivial as the wind cannot reach them. It's as close to an alien place as you can be on Earth. Here, Neuronic, though, has withstood the test of time. Her hull is almost in perfect shape. Her, her decks, though, are crumbling and caving in, and her single stack is gone, and so are the masts. They're lying on the ground next to the ship. She is still recognizable. Her superstructure hasn't failed yet, and she still holds some of that same old beauty she had when she was launched in 1892. She and the Titanic both still managed to do it, even if it is only a shadow of the beauty they once had. It leaves us sad that we could never see them in their glory. Like fossils are to dinosaurs, what we see now is only a shadow of what they once were, and we can only imagine them as they once were. The lighting inside the submarine was dim. It made the darkness outside feel physically heavy, and it contributed to the aura everyone felt about the wreck and heard in Ballard's words. There's not even a picture of the neuronic from before she was lost, so what we have found here is all we're left with. It makes me sad to see. The sub moved along the wreck, over her deck, and soon, nearly halfway down the length of the ship, they came to the superstructure. The bridge of the ship was in impeccable condition, still intact even, with the windows blown out, but the walls still standing. Light shone inside the ship's bridge for the first time since she sank, chasing the complete darkness away for the first time in so long, even if it was just for a few minutes. Look at that, Ballard softly gasped. Neuronic's bridge and superstructure are still standing, even though her decks are starting to sag. But here is part of her that is almost untouched. It almost, it almost makes her seem defiant, like she was sunk but not conquered in the end. And it's incredible that she this entire time has been almost within shouting distance of the Titanic. No one noticed her, but she was here, defiant the whole time. Neuronic and Titanic are so close to each other, pointed at each other like they're calling out. There is kinship between these two vessels. They're both White Star Line passenger liners, both lost to icebergs, he repeated, almost unaware of the fact he did so. He almost sounded like he was halfway in a trance. Titanic just was the one we remembered, even after being sunk. Titanic is an enigma. We still love her as much as those who sailed on her or built her did. Neuronic and other shipwrecks get none, though. Why is that? What made Titanic specifically the one we never forgot. To say Brock Ballard had a unique view of ships was an understatement. 
He looked at them sometimes as if he viewed them as living things. He was almost able to give these inanimate objects a voice of their own. He could always read, as he put it, what a wreck was telling him. It was his unique view of ships, their stories, and their wrecks, and his ability to think outside of the box to find ones no one ever thought would be found, such as the Orang Madan, which almost no one thought existed, but he always had, and had proved it to be real when he found it, and now had done several expeditions to, and even fully 3D mapped the entire wreck, that had led him to finding so many, and being good at figuring out the secrets of their losses. He'd done it again when he had found the wrecks of the Lord Spencer and Prince Oscar nearby, and his unique investigative style led him to determine that the Lord Spencer sank so fast because the angle she had hit the Prince Oscar had essentially caused her hull to completely fail. Prince Oscar had only had a hole smashed into her, a large one, but nothing like the damage the larger ship had sustained in the hit. His unique approach to searching had led him too many such ships over the years. The Orang Madan had been the pinnacle and it had gotten eyes on him that now weren't just admirers. In fact, the owners of said eyes were awaiting his return to port already. But for now, Brock was doing what he did best. Finding out a story from just the wreck, shining light on them again, and giving them love again. The ocean floor is a desert of scattered wrecks like the skeleton coast in Africa, but one that is dark, cold, and here they are not visited. Some are never found. They're alone. Save for the other wrecks from many centuries that they share this desert with. Them and their crews who were lost with them, Ballard said. You sound like you're either speaking at a funeral or recording an audiobook you're writing as you record it. One of his assistants helping pilot the sub said. A few other people inside the sub chuckled too. Ballard did too and gazed away from the window and back at the others inside the sub with him. It's what I do, David. I had over 20 hours by the time we were done with our first study of the wreck of the Lord Spencer, and then that doubled when we found the Prince Oscar right next to her, Ballard said. I know. I was stuck in here with you the entire time, another assistant, Dave, said. I don't see how one man can have so much to say about a mangled passenger liner sitting upright on the bottom of the ocean. It was a bit of a running joke, but the three men in the sub with Ballard all had nearly identical names, David, Dave, and Damien. With them were two pilots actually at the helm of the submarine, employed not by Ballard or his team, but by the company that owned the research vessel they had launched from. David shook his head and chuckled again. <laughs> Still, I can't believe we found those. One eerie story in a rough area where it happened, and you come a-running, Brock. Hey, those are the stories I like, Ballard said, smirking and turning around to gaze out the window at the Neuronic again. The sub was now passing by her bridge, still shining its light into the dark windows. Two world wars had occurred. Man had been put on the moon. The world had gone to war against terrorism. And a global pandemic had struck all in the time between the last time light had shown in those windows and the present moment that it finally did again. Neuronic had been here the entire time. She hadn't changed. It was a strange thing to think about. So much had changed since she sunk, and she was a remnant of that time, but again, only a shadow of it. One little piece that had made it. No, I'll tell you what I can't believe. That we found the Neuronic. She's been in almost plain sight since 1985 when the Titanic was found. Other marine archaeologists even theorize she was close by, but to actually see her when no one else has since 1893? That, that's a different feeling, Ballard said, gazing at the ship, almost close enough to touch. A lot of people thought she was near the Titanic. How right they were, Dave agreed as one of the pilots moved the sub back from the ship a bit, in case another current pushed them again. Since their mission had been to try and access the interiors of the Titanic, and then assess the wreck site to prepare for the new 3D scan, they didn't have much time to study the Neuronic, only a few hours, enough time to throw some subs in the water and investigate the anomaly on the ocean floor, then they would have to return to the surface. Too soon the time was up and they had to go. Ballard, gazed out of the window as the Neuronic vanished back into the gloom. 
as the darkness closed in and reclaimed her. I'll come see you again soon, he said. He was already making plans. As soon as he could manage it, his new plan was to return and fully photograph and study the wreck. But the money the team had for the current expedition was running out. Once the clock struck midnight, the funds would go as dry as a gas tank after a thousand mile drive. So they would have to return to the United States. The mission had been for the Titanic, and it was over. They just had some time to spare to investigate the other wreck they'd found before the money was cut off. Fowler knew he could wrestle up some more for a return expedition due to the historical significance of the ship. Soon, the subs were emerging from the water and were hoisted out of the ocean by large cranes on the research vessel. The main crew employed by the ship's owners who kept things running was between 40 and 50 people. There had been 20 pilots who operated the manned and unmanned submarines, whichever was being used on this specific mission. The rest were engineers, electricians, and other necessary crew, such as cooks and cleaners. Everyone else on board were scientists, archaeologists, or engineers that were part of Ballard's research team. There were 17 laboratories throughout the ship. Her bridge towered proudly above the bow, overlooking the forward sections of the ship and out into the sea. The cranes, which were now hoisting the heavy submarines from the water, were located at the stern, at the port and starboard sides. The research vessel was a ship that Brock Ballard and his team contracted so frequently for their expeditions that her owners had Ballard's number saved at the top of their client contact list. He was somewhat of a VIP in their eyes since he was using their ship so frequently. It was the ship the team had used when they were employed on behalf of the United States government to search for the wrecks of some lost submarines and then a few naval vessels of historical significance from World War II that had been lost at various points around the Atlantic. And then, when they were searching for the missing Collins Line passenger SS Pacific right after, which had been funded on behalf of the United States government in return for Ballard actually managing to find all the wrecks they'd asked him to. He and his team had also been using the vessel when they'd found the wrecks of the Lord Spencer, Prince Oscar, and Orang Madan just the year before, along with some others. While searching for the Pacific back in 2026, they hadn't found her, but had found something a mangled outline they'd first seen on sonar that had turned out to be a sad mess of metal with caved-in decks that had once been a 19th century iron-hauled sailing or early steam-powered vessel, likely the latter. The hull was still standing, though heavily damaged, but the decks had mostly caved in everywhere. They'd approached from the starboard side, and the lights from the unmanned subs shone light upon the portholes in the side of the hull, free of glass and dark, illuminating the collapse rooms behind in a ghostly beam of bright light for the first time in who knew how long. No doubt it was easily over a hundred years since any light had touched that vessel. Most likely, it had easily been over a hundred and fifty years since any light had touched her. If he was honest with himself, Ballard thought, the ship might have been as old as the 1870s. Despite multiple expeditions back to the wreck in the year since, Ballard and his team had still never identified which ship she was, which shocked them as it was a large vessel. As twisted, mangled, and collapsed as it was, it was still large and likely had been a notable ship back in the day. It was just too damaged to make out anything specific that would identify it out of the hundreds of similar ships lost in the area in the 19th century. It was a mystery Ballard was still determined to solve, but he hadn't revisited the wreck in almost a decade. Other jobs had come up too frequently for a more personal mission like that to take place. The Orang Madan might have always been the one ship he wanted to prove real, and now that he had, he had gotten some serious notoriety from it. He hoped the influence would create a chance to finally return and solve the mystery. But that day was not today. Once he was able to give her her identity back, he would let her rest, but not until then. He wanted to know who she was and let the world know which ship she had been. Once Ballard was out of the submarine and back on deck, he immediately went to the lab where he had left his laptop. He opened it, sat down, and instantly began typing while playing back his audio log, working on his report about the state of the Titanic and their somewhat successful attempt to reach previously inaccessible areas deep inside her wreck, and then the discovery of the Neuronic. It was here that another member of his team, Alex, found him a few hours later, once the ship was already en route back to New York City. Uh, Brock? He called from the doorway. Ballard turned to face him, 
halfway through typing up a comment on the structural integrity of the Titanic. Yes, he asked. There's a call for you, Alex said, holding up a phone. I'm in the zone. Is it important or can you put them on hold? Ballard asked. Alex shrugged. Sure, buddy. I'll put the U.S. government on hold. It's just some big shot general in the U.S. Navy, so I'm sure he'll wait, he said, with sarcasm dripping into his voice as thick as the venom dripping from a viper's fangs would have been. Ballard was up right away, so suddenly he bumped the desk and knocked his laptop over. He swore between gritted teeth, picking up the laptop and putting it back, then hurried over and took the phone with a sigh, nodded to Alex and put it to his ear. This is Brock Ballard, he greeted. Alex watched him pace the room, and Ballard listened to what the general on the other end said. Then he finally nodded. Okay, I'm interested. There was a pause, then Ballard nodded. Okay, see you soon. Thank you. He lowered the phone away from his ear and turned back to Alex. Looks like we might have another job already. They want us to look for something. What? Alex asked. Ballard shook his head. I don't know. He wouldn't say until we meet in person. Must be something of big interest. We might need to be ready to extend the contract on this ship. You gonna accept? Alex asked. Ballard handed the phone back to him. Maybe. I don't even know what the job is. I'll hear him out at least. He said there'll be a private plane waiting in New York to take me to Washington. Seems big. Maybe they want us to find that missing atomic bomb off George's coast. Alex chuckled. I doubt it. Something clearly has them stirred up, though, Ballard relented. Might not need to rustle up more funds to come back to the Neuronic. Maybe they'll pay for it in return for whatever it is they want, Alex said. Ballard sat back down at his laptop, wanting to finish his report in the few days they had now until they arrived in port. Maybe, but they'll want me to find something no one else has before first. That's how Uncle Sam always works. Trust me, Alex. I know, he said going back to typing about the Titanic's surprising structural integrity. To the shock of many, RMS Titanic continues to withstand the mighty ocean. Our findings indicate that her structural support continues to stand. Her supports are still holding her decks aloft as well as they ever did. The ship is as recognizable as she was in 1985. With what we observed on this mission, we expect Titanic to survive much longer than was initially anticipated. She will easily make it into the next century in a recognizable state. Notable deterioration is limited to the upper decks. Five days later, Ballard was in Washington, D.C., wearing his best suit, as well as new dress shoes he'd had to rush out and buy, and was being escorted into a building on the Washington Navy Yard. He was led into a meeting room in the Naval History and Heritage Command Building of all places, and sitting at a table with several people in well-dressed suits. They gave off We're CIA vibes so intense that they might as well have been wearing pins that said it. Along with people representing some of the other agencies in the intelligence community of the United States and persons from the Department of Homeland Security as well, as well as several Navy generals and even an admiral. The room they were meeting in had gray painted walls and gray carpet with faint red speckles. It had no windows and was rectangular in shape. Coming in from the only door, one was looking along the length of the room rather than the width, and the only thing in it was a long table with chairs pulled up to it, and more chairs were lined along the wall. Ballard had met with officials and representatives of the United States government and Navy before, but never had before walked into a room with so many high-ranked people, and people from so many different agencies who all seemed on edge, clearly knowing there were a few other elected officials dire. that were nearly at the very top of the chain of command as well, sitting in the back with the admiral. You didn't get people from DHS, several other intelligence agencies, and high-ranked commanders of the United States Navy in a room unless it was serious. He half wondered if a submarine hadn't gone missing and they wanted him to look for it while there was a chance the crew were still alive, or before any sensitive technology on board was potentially found by someone else. As he found out, he wasn't far off, but what they were interested in was something that had not been seen in almost a hundred years. Mr. Ballard, one of the men in suits greeted as the door was closed behind him. Please sit. Thank you, Ballard said, taking the only seat available. Coffee? Someone asked. A machine was plugged in on a table by the door. Ballard shook his head. We trust that your trip was pleasant, the same person said. 
It was, yes, Ballard confirmed. So, what are we here for? A few people shifted around like they had sat in a fire ant nest. No one spoke for a moment, then one of the older generals with a slightly gravelly voice spoke up. Your reputation at being able to find Rex no one thinks can ever be found has gotten our attention. We need someone with exactly your skills to do something for us in a covert manner, one that doesn't make it obvious who is actually wanting a specific wreck found, he explained, his hands interlocked as he spoke. Obviously, we could look for a wreck if we needed to find it, but we don't want to make this specific search obvious. Plus, there's few people in the world who do it better than you. Can I actually hear what it is you want me to look for then? Ballard asked. He'd been told on the phone he would have to come to Washington to hear anything else other than, we need you to look for something in the ocean, which was a very vague answer he felt he couldn't respond to without learning more. And once there, he would have the choice of refusing after learning the actual details, but there would be non-disclosure agreements waiting if he did. There would be if he agreed to it as well, he also felt in his gut. There would also be some waiting for his entire crew if he accepted to lead a search for what the Navy was seeking. One of the generals nodded and leaned forward. All right, Mr. Ballard, we won't jerk you off any longer. The nature of what lies within the shipwreck we want you to find is different than any other time that the Navy, and by extension the United States government, has had you look for a wreck on our behalf. Those were only for finding and documenting those historic vessels and where they came to rest. You have a gift for finding them, Mr. Ballard. This time it's a bit more than that. He leaned back in his chair, cleared his throat, and began. In 1942, German submarine U-boat 116 left port for a patrol in the North Atlantic Ocean. She was alone and not part of a wolf pack. She sent a radio message on October 6th announcing her position was 45 degrees 0 minutes north, 31 degrees 30 minutes west, then nothing. She completely disappeared and was never heard from again. Fowler looked at everyone in the room and half shook his head. Okay, he said after a moment. And? Commanding the submarine was one Wilhelm Grime. He had a crew of 55 people. All were lost when the submarine disappeared. How, why, and where the U-boat was lost is a total mystery. She was in the middle of the ocean, and she essentially dropped off the face of the earth. The general, who seemed to be acting as the spokesperson for all the gathered posse of people, explained, Ballard still didn't get it. Why was this such a pressing topic that gathered all these people together? Okay, and? he asked. That was almost a hundred years ago. Far from the only U-boat that ever sank. What does that have to do with this? All previous records we had indicated that U-116 patrol, her fourth one, mind you, was perfectly normal and routine as the others. So she faded into obscurity. A little story among the thousands from the war. Get a thousand people in a room and I bet less than 20 would even know about her. However, the Defense Intelligence Agency and their British counterparts are always shifting through old files, finding new things from the war, and oftentimes they are mundane and boring, but recently our tea-sipping friends across the pond found something they sent to us. The general nodded to one of the individuals Ballard suspected to be from the CIA. He pulled a piece of paper from a smaller folder and cleared his throat. Recent documents the British uncovered from a recently discovered German bunker in Poland indicate that this missing submarine, U-116, was not departing on another typical patrol. The records saying she did were forged. She was on a different, secret mission entirely, the agent said, nodding to one of his fellows who picked up where he left off. As he did, a woman wearing the same outfit as the other CIA agents passed a copy to Ballard, who saw they were scanned copies of the documents being discussed. The bunker entrance had been blasted, closed, and buried, probably by the Nazis themselves as they retreated from the Allies' advance, and it was only just rediscovered and opened again. Inside, the archaeologists found an old leather briefcase still sitting on a table, and inside it were these documents. After being discovered, the documents found their way to a museum and then to MI6. These documents were written by some of the top officials 
in Nazi Germany. They're all dated to shortly before U-116 left for the patrol she disappeared on. And with the wet signatures on them, we have no doubts of their authenticity. How they find their way into one of those Nazi bunkers in Poland, we do not know. Things ended up in odd places quite a bit during the final months of the war. All went silent as Ballard flipped through the pages before looking up, shaking his head. I don't read German. What do they say? They're about U-116? He asked. The general who had been leading the conversation nodded. Yes. The submarine's official mission, another patrol, was a cover for their true one. U-116 left Lorient, France on September 22, 1942 on what most thought was her fourth patrol. In fact, what was actually happening was that she had a new experimental so-called Wunderwaffel on board. According to the document, you have a copy of in your hand now, Mr. Ballard. It was an energy-based weapon that could possibly have been used to blow up entire fleets at once from a distance. But she was lost before they could test it on a smaller allied fleet or individual ship. He paused to gauge Ballard's reaction, which was a mix of shock, confusion, and disbelief, before he spoke again. Yes, that is a reasonable reaction before you have all the information. He smiled for a moment, then his face turned serious. The facts, Mr. Ballard, are this. He placed his folded hands on the table in front of him and sighed deeply. Speaking unbiasedly, it is no secret that Hitler had some of the best scientists in the world, and they were experimenting with all kinds of things. And this little missing mine-laying submarine from World War II had one of the most advanced prototype weapons the world had ever seen up to that point on board. With how advanced of a concept alone the weapon was, especially for the time, and even by today's standards, we believe German scientist Arne Wolf, who regrettably disappeared in 1945 and was never found, likely helped build it. The man now nodded to the CIA people again, one of whom scooted forward back to the table. From all accounts, he was a genius, helped build the V-2 rockets, and was always there to determine if Hitler's craziest fantasy weapon could be made real. He even worked on bringing some of the craziest into reality. By all accounts, Wolf was also a fanatic, a dangerous combination. This has his fingerprints all over it, and someone who has his initials is referred to as the Builder in the documents themselves. According to the description itself, the weapon is a box-shaped object, not very large, and is somewhat shaped like an old film projector if the exterior parts were removed, leaving just the box shape. The energy beam was fired out of the equivalent of the lens. If Wolf had been captured, we both might know more and have gone looking for this thing sooner when only we were in the know about it. But again, Arne Wolf was never found and unfortunately a lot of his personal writings and journals disappeared with him. There's a handful of mysteries from the final months of World War II he likely would have known the answers to. Someone from O and I muttered to herself. The general spoke now. One of our predecessors from back then wrote that he was killed in a secret operation in 1946 but they did not include any details, so the validity of that, we truly don't know. There is no context, just that he was. Plus, we cannot find any record or order of this mission having ever occurred, or who was involved, even in classified documents. Officially, he disappeared after World War II. If he was killed, we don't know. Many historians think he escaped to South America, and we have found nothing in our recent investigation on him to prove or disprove that. The point being, though, that since he disappeared, and all of his personal writings did too, verifying some of the details is complicated. Ballard knew a little bit about Arne Wolf. Wolf's disappearance after the war had caused a lot of conspiracy theories over the years. It was one of the most investigated cases of a Nazi vanishing after World War II that had never been solved. People claimed to have sighted or tracked him down to Italy, Greece, South Africa, the Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, Finland, every country in South America, the United States, and Soviet Union, but none of those leads were ever proven. Online theories ranged from reasonable, such as a U-boat ferrying him to Argentina shortly before the war ended, U-977 was often suggested to have been the one, since it only surrendered months after World War II ended, to the crazy, such as him trading secret Nazi technology to the Allies in exchange for a new identity, 
or the absurd, such as him still being alive and leading a cult of Nazis in Agartha, raising an army of dinosaurs and zombie Nazis to conquer the world. That last one had given Ballard a headache when he'd listened to someone explain it on a video, and there were people in the comments who fully believed it. There had also been a movie made about that theory, which had gotten terrible reviews and bombed. Wolf giving the Allies secret technology, much of which had been proven to have never existed, in exchange for his freedom and a new identity, sounded much more reasonable by comparison. He had become the target of so many conspiracy theorists over the decades. Ballard came back from his thoughts as the CIA agent was more thoroughly explaining the purpose of the weapon that U-116 had been carrying. This weapon itself would reportedly fire an energy beam at a target, say a ship, and it would cause it to, essentially, liquefy. The beam could be fired from miles away, and if it was focused enough, entire fleets would just melt into liquid metal. Now, everyone from all the gathered intelligence agencies, be them DHS, CIA, or NGA, and any of the number of the others, all began speaking over and interrupting one another. They first tested it in 1939 and worked on it until 1942. According to these documents, it worked and they were ready to test it on a ship, and it was lost with the submarine. We're looking again into what happened to RNA, but more to the point, Germany really was ahead of the rest of us in a lot of ways when it came to science. Germany had many of the best scientists in the world and they were experimenting with all kinds of things. Hitler was just too scared to actually use his Wunderwaffel, or too reluctant. Old Adolf is like that one thorn in your side that you can't get rid of no matter how hard you pick at it. This one, it seems, he was open to using. It at least seems like this time they had planned to at least test it on an enemy ship and evaluate. And the submarine with the weapon on board was lost before it could be tested. And it's regrettable, we have only learned about this now, the general added, and the intelligence community representatives quieted down. The Admiral seemed content to remain silent in the back because he now turned for the first time to one of the representatives from the Defense Intelligence Agency and nodded to them. They had been silent, but now scooted forward to the table and spoke. We aren't the only ones who learned about this. We know some or all of this information got leaked to Russia before MI6 got their hands on the documents and took them. And here lies the problem. You see, neither of us have a weapon like this. Sure, we have all the WMD you could want for world annihilation, but neither of us truly want world annihilating MAD to become a thing either. So we're in balance with one another. A weapon like this, neither of us have it. And if Wall side gets it, then the balance is tipped to them. Suddenly they hold more cards. A weapon that could melt ships, or maybe even planes, or satellites for all we know, has the potential of being a... WMD equivalent without the world-ending stakes of most WMD. You could, in theory, take out a whole fleet with this thing before they even know you're there. And unfortunately, we can't replicate the device because the records on how it was made seem to be lost, probably destroyed in the Battle of Berlin. What we have here seem to be the only ones that slipped out and survived. So, all we have for how the weapon works is theory, and right now that is not good enough, because we know they want it as much as we do. So theory won't work, we need the device itself, one DIA agent said. It's like the Antikythera almost, it's a strangely advanced device for the time, but we can't even reproduce it now without the original base to go on. It would be like trying to rebuild the Antikythera without the original and only going off some vague text on what it could do and how, another clarified. China will likely try to get involved as well once they learn about it, but Russia is our main competitor right now, one of the gentlemen from the CIA who had previously spoken up said. And then everyone started trying to talk all again at once. Everyone will want this thing. If Russia knows we're looking too, they'll rush to get out there and then it'll be a race. Like the space race, only to the bottom of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge instead of to Luna. Ballard tried to listen to everyone, but all those in the room kept trying to get their urgent points made, convey the importance, interrupting or simply speaking over one another. Everyone wanted to make their point and make sure they were heard. Finally, the general put a hand up and smacked the table, which quieted everyone. It's funny how old secrets tend to reveal themselves eventually, he said once everyone was quiet and looked at Ballard. So, Mr. Ballard, as I'm 
Sure, you see now, we are interested in looking for this U-boat. However, a quick initial search of the area proved fruitless. We found no sign of her with the scan of the ocean floor west of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and it would be obvious we, what we were doing if we moved more divisions out there to search the area. And then, as we said, Russia would scramble to get out there, and it's a race to find it instead of a solo hike. We want to keep that from happening, so we haven't increased our presence in the region to an extent that would be obvious. That spurred everyone to start talking over one another at the same time again. But seeing as you have proven to have a gift at finding wrecks thought lost forever, someone from O and I said, including ones with less information about them and an area to start in than you have here, you even found the wreck of the Lord Spencer and Prince Oscar and put an end to that mystery. Someone else from the CIA who had been quiet up to that point interrupted to add in. And you also found the Orang Madan and no one thought she existed. You not only found a wreck most people believe never existed, you also proved the unconfirmed story of it to be true against every feasible odd. You proved it. One of the most famous urban legends of all time you proved was actually more than just a story. Another person from DHS who Ballard hadn't learned the name of interrupted to say, unable to hide some of his admiration for the man. Then we believe you could perhaps find this sub given enough time and resources, the same CIA person continued. Assuming the weapon didn't misfire and melt her instead, someone else from the same group muttered quietly in a cynical way. And that, Mr. Ballard, is where you come into this story. As you were told on the phone, we want you to look for something in the ocean. We want you to find U-116. Yes, it is a needle in the world's biggest haystack, but you have a gift for finding shipwrecks. You view ships almost as if they were alive. You're good at thinking about possibilities no one else ever has. We think you can find U-116 before anyone else, the general said, not having heard the final comment and silencing everyone else, getting control of the excited room again. He leaned forward and met eyes with the slightly overwhelmed-looking Ballard. If you find the submarine, determine if it is intact. If it is, then you confirm or deny that the artifact is on board, Retrieve it if possible, or confirm its destruction if the sinking was catastrophic. Though some of our engineers seem hopeful she might have sunk intact due to a failure of her electrical systems. We do not believe she was attacked. We would be most grateful. A simple search and recovery operation, the general said, leaning back again. And of course, you would be well compensated. In return for doing all of this for us, you will receive a full funding from the United States government for your searches and research for the next five years. And if you can retrieve the object we seek from inside the wreck or confirm if it's destroyed, if it's there, we don't actually know that it is, but it is last mentioned being on the U-boat as it left on the trip it vanished on. So it's on the bottom of the ocean somewhere. The documents were very vague and written by people in the know already. Then it'll be 10 years of full funding and access to some of the best research equipment the Navy has to offer. That isn't classified, of course. Any expedition or research mission you want to mount, you'll have the funding. Any shipwreck you want to spend years looking for, if need be, go for it. You can still refuse, of course, as well. You have every right. We simply will have you sign the non-disclosure agreement we mentioned now and show you out. What do you say? He waited expectantly. Ballard was silent for a moment as he finally had a chance to process everything he had heard and let it all sink in. He bit his lip. Can I have a moment to think? Of course, the general replied, smiling. Everyone stared at the marine archaeologist as he sat at the end of the table, silent, still as a statue, deep in thought, with his hand resting on his chin as he mulled all the details he'd been told. He didn't even blink the whole time, simply staring off into space as his mind wandered and processed it all. Once, Ballard took a moment to think about it, he looked back up again and asked, What kind of U-boat was U-116? A Type XB mine-laying U-boat, one of the people who looked like they were CIA said, looking very pleased. Ballard still wasn't actually sure if that's who the group of people were, but they sure gave off the vibe of it. Ballard nodded thoughtfully at the answer. Okay, long-range mine-laying and cargo transport. I found one of those before off the East Coast, he muttered thoughtfully. Ballard put a hand to his chin again and nodded. 
Dimensions? What was her size? He asked. One of the DHS people shifted through some papers and held one up. 249 feet, 7 inches long, beam 30 feet, 2 inches, height 33 feet, 6 inches, she said. Engine type? Ballard asked. Four-stroke diesel, the same woman answered. What was the area the last communication was heard from again? Ballard then asked. 45 degrees, 0 minutes north, 31 degrees, 30 minutes west, a young woman from the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency said. Ballard thought for a moment of where that would be in the North Atlantic relative to some of the geologic features in the area. Likely somewhere south of the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone on the west side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge and east of the Flemish Cap. If you drew a triangle connecting those three points on a map, she'd probably be in there somewhere, Ballard said. He was silent for a moment as he thought everything through, and then he spoke again. The last communication before she disappeared was when? October 6, 1942, the first woman replied. And do we have any idea of where she went after that last communication, Ballard asked. Everyone shook their heads, and the same general who had started the conversation leaned forward again. No. Though, given her cargo, we estimate she was likely somewhere further west of that last communication when she went down. On the west side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we guess, in the direction she might be more likely to quickly find Allied ships, closer to our coast than she was when last heard from, likely within a few days' travel distance of that last communication. Ballard took everything they said in, shook his head, and exhaled. <sighs> Long odds. That's a big area and a tiny target. The ocean floor is a desert, and the wrecks are the occasional oasis in that desert. Really is looking for the needle in the world's biggest haystack. The North Atlantic Ocean is a huge area, and you say it's unknown when, after that last communication, the U-boat suffered whatever fate befell her. She could be anywhere. Even if we narrow it down to, say, a 50-mile circle around where she was last known to be, that is still a whole lot of empty ocean to search. Let me tell you what else is down there. Mountain ranges, valleys, extinct volcanoes, ravines and crevasses, not to mention the crushing water pressure. It's the single most hazardous environment on the planet. That's why I prefer to use unmanned subs for most of my expeditions. And U-116 could be in any of those spots. She could be perched on the edge of a mountain, teetering over the edge, buried in mud or in some underwater avalanche, nestled down in a trench or ravine. Not to mention there's dozens of other missing U-boats that could be in the same area and we could easily find one of those first and waste time trying to identify if we have the right one. Looking for something like a specific U-boat on the bottom of the ocean is way harder than it might sound. I don't know if you fully grasp how much of an investment in time and money you're looking at for this mission, he said, now the one leaning forward on the table and staring back at the general. Resources are no concern, Mr. Ballard, if that is what you're concerned about. Uncle Sam has you covered. He has a blank check with your name on it for this task. We're going to look for this submarine either way, but we would like to do it in a covert way that doesn't arouse suspicion that that is what we're doing. You leading a search for a shipwreck in the ocean won't raise any eyebrows at all. And we really would like you to do it. You're probably the only man who can find her quickly. And if you find it, you know what we are offering for you in return. Do you accept this proposal? Ballard was silent for a moment, so the general added, People today don't care about history, Mr. Ballard. That's why this sub and so many other stories are forgotten. But with the kind of funding you would receive in payment, you could help change that and bring people's attention back to these stories. And if something thought lost forever, like the Titanic, can be found with only an inaccurate position given out as a clue two hours before she sank, then U-116 can be found too. Ballard slowly nodded, thinking everything over again. The story, the supposed weapon, the last given position the geologic features of the North Atlantic Ocean floor that he and his team would have to navigate, the potential hazards, the promised rewards, and what he and his team could achieve with it. He thought of it all. Then, he slowly let out a deep sigh, 
licked his lips, and nodded again. General, my team and I will lead your search for U-116, he said. Several people clapped. We can't extend the contract, Brock, Max reported, shaking his head as he hung up the phone call. Some Swedish geologic team needs the ship for a trip to somewhere near Iceland. That's going to take months, and then after that, another team from Norway is going to take her down to Antarctica. Her owner said it'll be a year at least till we can contract her again, even as VIP clients. Ballard opened his laptop and started typing. It's fine, we'll contract another one, he said. Ballard and his team had accepted the assignment collectively once they'd been briefed, and, like he had expected, they had all signed non-disclosure agreements. Despite Uncle Sam handing over his blank check and being ready to send some very high-tech equipment, including an advanced sonar system that would scan the ocean floor to a much greater degree of detail than any other system like it, along with two unmanned submarines and some of the best small ROVs in the world, small enough that they could enter a wrecked U-boat, Ballard and his team were not going to be sent with a military escort or with any military vessels. The research vessel that they had been using had already been signed over to another team the day before when their previous contract expired, so now the team was hunting for a replacement vessel that would do the job. The Navy wasn't going to get them one. It was on them to find one. If it wasn't being kept as secret as possible, the Navy would have taken them out on one of their best ships, but since the idea was to keep Russia under the impression that either the United States were not aware or not interested in looking for the U-boat, they couldn't just go straight to the area without drawing attention. So Ballard and his team were going to have to make it look like any other expedition that they were a part of, but they needed a ship. It was only a few days after Ballard's initial meeting with the representatives of the Navy and the intelligence community, and he and his team were all gathered together in a conference room Uncle Sam's check had rented out for them in one of the city's nice hotels. Aside from Ballard, his inner circle consisted of Dave, David, and Damien, or the Three Stooges, as they had been affectionately nicknamed due to sometimes not taking things as seriously as they should have, Max Hall, Ballard's right-hand man, along with Newest members, Alex Hanley and Sarah Malcolm. It was Alex who was the newest member, but Sarah had only been with the team two years. She had joined them when Ballard and his team undertook a search for the missing SS Waratah. They unfortunately found nothing, but she heard about it before it was launched, and since she had an ancestor who was on the ship, wanted to join in the search for it. Ballard had met with her personally and approved her joining them in part due to her passion on the subject, and also in part due to being the very point of the mission to give the descendants of those who had been on board the ship answers at long last. Just like everyone else who had gone looking, though, they didn't find any sign of the Waratah, but Sarah did still seem to find some peace with her family's century-spanning mystery despite that. Alex had only been with them a few months, and aside from Sarah, everyone else had been on the team alongside Ballard for years. Max was the only one who had been there since the beginning, when Ballard had put together his own archaeological team. He was Ballard's right-hand man. Other than these individuals, the rest of the team consisted of about 15 other people, experts in history, archaeology, geology, and a number of other fields, but it was the seven gathered together now who made up the inner circle. Let's try to find one that'll work. It doesn't have to be the highest quality ship, Brock said. In fact, it might work to our advantage if it's not the most advanced thing in the world, Sarah commented. If it floats, I'll be happy, Max said, typing on his own laptop. What do you think of this ship, Brock? Alex asked after a little time passed. Brock and Max went over and looked at the ship Alex had found. The ship in the picture was not the most glamorous looking in appearance. Her white paint smudged with gray grime and streaks of rust running down her side from the deck like tears. She looked like the long-lost twin sister of the well-known research ship Keldish. However, housed within her was everything that the team would need for commanding the mission, as well as the possible salvage operation that would follow. Hmm, Brock said, looking over Alex's shoulder, while Max looked over his. Well, she is the same kind of vessel as the one we've been using, only about ten years older, but... It has everything we need, it looks like. He looked at the ship's name. The Domina Libertatis. And he found he liked it. 
She's already docked in New York, and she's available for lease immediately. Crew are on standby and ready for a charter at a moment's notice, Alex added. Brock nodded. Make the call. Let's put some dollar signs on that blank check. As Alex made the call, he said to himself, This must be what it feels like to be rich. And with that, they had found their ship. They fast-tracked the process of getting everything in order and sent word to the general that Ballard had been in communication with, and he sent the equipment right away. By the end of the week, the sonar systems had been installed on the underside of the hull, the new unmanned subs were being hoisted up onto the vessel, and the team were all at the docks to meet her and her crew. She was not the most glamorous vessel in person, either. She looked greasy, but she would do the job. All she had to do was float. Finally, by mid-morning that day, everything was loaded. Including all the equipment, the entire team, their baggage, and in some cases, their baggage's baggage. As the team boarded, the vessel's captain, Joseph Ken Phillips, stepped away from his crew as they were hoisting the last of the submarines over the stern with a large crane and approached the team. He was middle-aged, largely built, had a wrinkled face, was slightly balding with white hair, and... As he greeted his passengers, he spoke with a thick Czech accent, but he was still understandable. I understand we are to leave as soon as possible. Once we have the last of your equipment on board, we'll be underway. He paused and licked his lips with a small chuckle. You have some very... expensive equipment. Ballard half smiled and shrugged. When you search the deep ocean for something, you need the best. Captain Phillips nodded, intrigued. So it is a shipwreck we are looking for. A historically significant wreck, yes, Ballard confirmed. Treasure ship? The captain asked, looking excited. Are we looking for the Shinko Shagas? Max laughed, and Ballard chuckled. <laughs> Not really. We don't tend to be the ones who get to look for anything so glamorous. Yeah, we're not billionaires, Max chuckled. They're the only ones who ever get to look for those wrecks. Soon, the last sub was hoisted up and secured to the aft deck. Captain Phillips commented something about his new crew doing an incredible job, and Ballard asked what he meant. Oh, we had a big turnover just in the last 48 hours. 30 of my 45 crew quit overnight. Resignation letters sent in the mail. Never even saw them walk out. The ship's owners came through, though, and quickly contracted out these 30 new lads to replace them. Hard-working blokes, the lot of them. Ballard must have looked a little off-put, because Captain Phillips put a hand on his shoulder. Don't worry, my friend. Full replacements have been hired for all those who walked out. It won't interfere with your expedition or research. Reassured, Ballard pulled the captain off to the side and pulled out a manila envelope from his bag and discreetly held it out. It's from the U.S. Navy. I was told to give it to the captain of the ship we hired. You are to burn or shred this after you read it, and you can't share it with anyone. They decided the captain, at least, should be in the know of what we're looking for and why. He nodded and held it out, and a now somewhat off-put Captain Phillips hesitantly reached out and took it. He left the deck crew in the capable hands of one of his officers and left for his quarters to read the letter inside the envelope. He returned shortly after, without the envelope, and simply nodded to Ballard, his mouth in a firm line. Where are we heading? he asked. For now, just head for the west side of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, longitudinally parallel with the northwestmost point of Spain's coastline, Ballard answered. I'll give you the actual coordinates once we're closer. In his head, he added, Might be a good idea not to book it immediately for the coordinates either, if our competitors are actually ready to pounce. Phillips nodded and, seeing preparations on deck were finished, left Ballard as he and his team made their way inside the ship for their quarters and then to meet up in the largest lab inside the vessel. Meanwhile, Captain Phillips headed up the exterior stairs until he reached the vessel's bridge. Ready to leave? He asked his first officer, who was the officer on deck. Absolutely, Captain, was the answer. Captain Phillips straightened out his white uniform as he stepped up to the helm and gazed down at the monitors and then out of the forward-facing windows. Stow the gangway. Pull the lines in. Let me know when the bow and stern are clear, he said. It was only a few seconds before he got the confirmation from his crew. Bow thrusters full to port, was the captain's next order. Slowly, his ship veered away from the dock as her engines whirred to life, starting quiet but then growing to a roar that would have impressed anyone who thought her appearance matched her capabilities. 
In truth, despite looking like an old, weathered girl barely holding herself together, the Domina Libertatis was a strong, proud vessel. Phillips's own old reliable. Once they were an acceptable distance away from the dock, he nodded to his first officer again and did a quick final check of all the monitors and status of each system. Take her to sea, Captain Phillips said once he was sure everything was ready to go. The Domina Libertitis soon was making her way out of the harbor and into the open ocean, powering up to full ahead once she was clear of any obstacles in her path, and Operation Baltic Sea Anomaly had begun. The name was christened by the Navy and not Ballard's team. It was a name that served two purposes, both as a red herring to any information the Russians might gather about what the Americans were doing, and as a homage, and hopefully omen, to finding something underwater. Officially, the team was operating under the guise of having chartered the research vessel for the task of searching for military shipwrecks that had never been located in the interest of historical documentation exactly like the mission they had done for the Navy over a decade before. However, in truth, the search for U-116 was on. The trip out to the region of the North Atlantic Ocean where they would be operating in passed without incident. Over the few days, Ballard and his team finished preparing for their upcoming search and formulating their plan. The ocean floor was going to be scanned from the ship, and if any anomalies were spotted that could fit being the U-boat and they could not be ruled out conclusively as something else, then one of the unmanned submarines tethered to the ship with a multi-mile long cable would be submerged and sent down to investigate and confirm what the object was. Okay, Ballard said on the morning before the ship would reach their starting point. He and his team were gathered in the largest lab, and he was standing in front of a whiteboard on the wall. The room had windows on one wall and rows of counters on the far side with aisles between them and one door positioned parallel to the ends of the rows of the counters. Some of his team were sitting back at the counters, some at the tables on Ballard's side of the room. Ballard drew a rough outline of the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the Charlie Gibbs Fracture Zone, and the Flemish Cap, along with the Labrador Sea and simple depictions of the coasts of Spain, Portugal, Greenland, and Saint-Pierre and Miquelon. Nearly right in the middle of it all, he wrote the coordinates of U-116's last known position and finished it off by adding a dot right on the spot. He then turned to face his team again. Everyone was gathered for this meeting, those who had been told everything previously and the others who were only just now learning all the details. Right. U-116's last known position was 45 degrees, 0 minutes north, 31 degrees, 30 minutes west. We're going to start... He turned to face the board and drew a not-so-perfect circle around the dot representing the last known position of the U-boat by scanning the ocean floor in this general area. We'll start from our last known position, which, taking into account margin of error from the time, might not be completely accurate, but it'll be in the ballpark somewhere, and go until we search this circle. It's a 50-mile radius in all directions of the last known position. I'd bet all the money on the blank check we were given that she's in that bubble somewhere. We're just going to have to go around and around until we search it all. If she's not there, we widen it to 100 miles in all directions. A few members of his team looked sick at the idea of searching so much of the ocean floor, even from the comfort of a ship, and Ballard nodded in understanding. I don't like it either, but money is no concern. They told us not to come back until we found it. The guy's exact words to me were, Don't come back till you find it no matter how long it takes. Don't worry about the money. Uncle Sam has you covered. Just find it. So let's get ready to start looking. He turned and faced the map, pointing again. Obviously, the elephant in the room is this. Where is she? He turned and faced his team again. Any questions? He asked. No one on his team answered, nor did Captain Phillips, who Ballard had had join them for his brief, so everyone would be on the same page. Okay, he said. He put his marker down and went back to his laptop as everyone worked to finish making final preparations. How long till we get there, Captain? Sarah Malcolm asked, looking up from her own laptop. One day. Any of you need anything, you let me know, he answered, before leaving the lab and the team to their final preparations. God, if she's on the side of a mountain that makes up the ridge, she's going to be almost impossible to find, Alex Hanley said, looking at the satellite imagery of the region they were searching. Look at the geology down there. Yeah, and I'm worried about what it's not seeing. 
given the Three Stooges over there are going to be the ones piloting the subs when we get wet, Max Hall replied. Dave looked up from over his laptop screen. Bite me, he said. Sarah snorted and tried to hide it. Everyone knew she had a flirty crush on Dave, and from the flush in her cheeks, her mind was certainly elsewhere than whatever she was supposed to be reading about. Lots of high-tech stuff you're working with, First Officer Dylan Moore said later that day when Ballard passed him on the deck. He was roughly Ballard's age, was wearing the same white uniform as Captain Phillips, and his face was shaven. Ballard stopped, not having noticed him leaning against the railing. Yeah, the Navy paid for it. They want a few shipwrecks from World War II to be found since it's a hundred years since World War II started. They want some of the U.S. ships that were lost, found, and documented for something they have planned for the anniversary. Ballard replied, going almost automatically into the cover story he'd been told to give to any curious crew. He was about to keep walking when he paused and looked back. So, the captain is Czech, but the ship isn't. How is it that an American got to be the first officer when the ship also is an American? Moore snorted and laughed. The whole crew ain't Czech, mate. The second officer is Swedish, the third officer is from Poland, fourth is Danish, fifth is from Yemen, and like half the deck crew are German. The ship is also technically German, but she's owned by a company from the Czech Republic. And the ship's name is Italian, Ballard asked with a hint of amusement in his voice. Moore smirked. Yep, he nodded. Makes about as much sense to you as it does to me. Ballard chuckled and Moore held a hand out. Dylan Moore, he greeted. Brock Ballard, Ballard replied, shaking the man's hand. Yeah, I know. I've seen some of your interviews. Those ones you did, what was it, last year when you found those two wrecks off South America? What do they look like? I was honestly very interested, but you never shared many pictures. I did that on purpose. It's a sad sight. What does the Lord Spencer look like? Mangled. She's upright, but twisted all to hell. Her superstructure and decks have collapsed. The only thing really left is her hull. It's iron, which is why it's lasted this long, but it's slumping crumbled and smashed in from where she hit the Prince Oscar. She looked lonely. Felt like it too, and sad, but lonely was the real emotion I got from her. She must have been happy to see you, Moore chuckled. Ballard half shrugged. Sometimes it seems Rex are. I can't really explain why, but sometimes they just have a feel to them, you know? Anyway, we also scanned her, and it seems like when she hit the Prince Oscar, her keel might have just cracked and opened like a zipper almost. No way to know for sure if that was from when she hit the ocean floor or in the collision or just from being underwater so long, but if it was in the collision, it's no wonder she sank as quickly as the Prince Oscar survivors all said she did. If it happened in the collision, she would have flooded nearly instantly. The Prince Oscar is in much better shape, but... Where the collision occurred is buried. She didn't fully right herself after she sank. We scanned her too. There's a huge hole in the hall under the ground. Realizing he was starting to go into a passion field rant, Ballard let himself trail off there, but Moore still seemed interested. Shame to hear about the condition the Lord Spencer is in. I saw your stuff last year too when you proved the Orang Madame was a real ship, but I found the older ships to be more interesting. I have a lot of respect for the sailors of that era. They were built different, had real guts. They had to know the stars to cross the ocean, didn't have all this satellite navigation or advanced equipment we do now. Incredible stuff. He nodded. You're good at finding shipwrecks, it seems no one else can find. Seems like the Navy got the right guy, Moore said. Ballard shrugged. I hope. I'm feeling kind of lost on this one. Daunting, Moore asked. Trying to find something that's been missing for almost a hundred years, but no one else has found? Ballard said, trailing off. The Lord Spencer and Prince Oscar were older, yes, but we had an area we know they sank, so we knew for sure where to look. We don't have that for what we're looking for this time. All we have for one wreck is a last known position, and then she kept going and was never seen again. Could be anywhere down there. Might need a big fat dose of luck for this one. No, I get it, Moore said. I don't think I could do it. Hey, sorry for the sudden question. Again. But, what's the weirdest thing you've ever found underwater? 
I'm sorry. I just find what you do so interesting. Uh, Ballard said, a little surprised and flattered at the sudden question. He didn't expect a sudden improvised game of 20 questions. Well, about 15 years ago, we did find a chair sitting upright on the ocean floor. Middle of nowhere, not near any shipping lanes, nowhere near land, and it was a school chair too. A little off-putting, I think it gave Dave some mechanophobia. Moore laughed. <laughs> a man who spends his life looking for shipwrecks has a fear of man-made objects underwater? Ballard nodded. It is what it is. He's a good guy, though. Man, his idea of a scary campfire story must be sitting around reading about the old underwater transatlantic telegraph cables. Ooh, Moore said, making a ghost sound. Ballard shook his head. <laughs> You're not too far off, he admitted. Now, aside from the chair, one of the worst things that caught me off guard was this globster we nearly smashed into in the Pacific Ocean once. Damn thing almost looked like a plesiosaur. Have you ever seen a picture of the Zoamaru carcass? That's almost exactly what it looked like. Ballard remembered that the scare it gave him and Dave, the two had been monitoring the live feed from the submersible at the time, vividly. The sub had been passing over the sandy ocean floor several thousand feet down when suddenly, after hours of only seeing that in the camera, a pale pink and white face with what looked like hollowed out eyes and a long thin neck and a large body swam right into the beam of light. Ballard had jumped several steps backwards. Oh my God, he would gasped at the sudden appearance, feeling a jolt of adrenaline hit him. Dave's reaction had been even better. He'd almost fallen out of his chair as he jumped back and shouted, What the shit? Is that a plesiosaur? Shaking from the surprise, Ballard had stepped forward and gazed at the animal as it passed by and back into the gloom, and then sighed. Oh, it's just a carcass. Dave had leaned back in his chair and threw his hands over his eyes. Oh my god, he groaned. Damn. What was it? Moore asked when Ballard had told him that little story. Basking shark carcass, the both of them. The bottom jaws had fallen off, so they looked like they had really long necks. But I tell you, the way it was drifting in the current made it look like it was swimming. Also, once, while we were looking for the African Star, it was an American ship torpedoed by a U-boat in World War II. It was a personal favor someone owed someone and we got the contract. We didn't find her, but we did find bones. Huge bones on the ocean floor. The really creepy part? They've never been identified as being from a known animal. Damn, Moore said, then half glared. You're not pulling my leg, are you? Hell no, Ballard assured, chuckling. Moore shook his head. This is fascinating. I could listen to these stories all day. Well, I'm going to go get some food, but come on and I'll tell you another one on the way, Ballard said. He and Moore set off as Ballard launched into another one of his stories. This one was early in my career, but still one we have no explanation to. We were working off the southern coast of the U.S. because a potential shipwreck was found by some people diving, and they found what was left in the sand, timber jutting out like ribs on a skeleton. So we go out there, determine that it is a wreck, and we date it. We've been thinking maybe Civil War, or possibly 16th or 17th century Spanish vessel at the oldest. The damn thing was a galley from the 13th century, probably 200 years older than Christopher Columbus. One of the oldest wrecks I've ever worked on. How the hell that thing got there or who was on board, we have no idea. I had a big controversial theory about it. It was my first time really getting people all up in arms with an idea of mine, but it sure wasn't the last. He and Moore chatted for the rest of the evening, Moore eating up all of it as Ballard regaled him with some of his personal favorite, the craziest, and most personal searches or the most unexpected or mysterious findings from investigations over the years. At one point, Moore asked what it was like to see the Titanic in person, and Ballard's answer was, She still manages to be just as awe-inspiring as she always was. Her prow is still proud-looking as it was in 1912. She might be a wreck now, but there's still some of her beauty still in it. What I'd give to have seen her alive and sailing in person, and not just in animations or pictures. Simply put, she is still as incredible as she was in 1912. The first time you see her, it's daunting, awe-inspiring. 
she still makes you feel small. By the end of the night, the two had become friends, and Ballard agreed to share more of his stories with Moore before the expedition was over. It wasn't even noon the next day when they reached the last known coordinates of U-116. The ocean looked big and empty around the Domina Libertitis. Brock and Max stood together at the railing, leaning against it and gazing out in the ocean. They were in a patch of calm water that would have rivaled the doldrums. Hard to believe she was here once, Max said. Ballard nodded. Yeah. Now we have to find her. The search phase of Operation Baltic Sea Anomaly was beginning. You don't seem to have your usual confidence, Max said. Brock nodded and stepped back a few paces from the side railing. Maybe because of the stakes this time. Never had ones like it. It's never been a race, you know. We've done searches for the Navy before, but this is the first time they're breathing down our, the backs of our necks to get it done. No, I get it, Max agreed. Brock sighed. It's just... Before, I've always looked for ships that interest me, or someone wanted us to look for. It's never been for the reason we're looking for you 116 It just hits different. He looked back out at the still ocean and took a deep breath. <sighs> I'd like to be out here looking for her on my own terms. But it seems fate didn't want that to be the case. Somewhere down there, in the dark, was U-116, and thousands of other unidentified wrecks, including dozens of other nearly identical missing U-boats. U-116 wasn't just going to be a needle in a haystack. Looking for her was going to be like looking for one specific needle among thousands scattered throughout the world's largest haystack. And there were a thousand things that might keep her from being found. What if she imploded after sinking, or exploded near the surface, or what if she was nestled down under a cliff or in a trench, or what if the Nazis' prototype weapon melted her? A lot of things could make finding her impossible, and Ballard thought that even a blank check might have a limit after all. Well, if anyone can pull it off, I think you're the man, he heard Max then say. Brock looked at him as he continued. You don't just have a knack for finding ships no one thinks will ever be found. You also have found some people thought never existed. You also see them unlike anyone else. You don't see the wreck. You see what it was. It's story. It's people. Brock, there's an excitement and passion in you for this field I've never seen matched in anyone. I think... If only one person on this planet can find you 116, it's you. Brock leaned back against the railing and chuckled at his friend. <laughs> Maybe it's just the ballards of the world who have good luck, he mused. Robert found the Titanic, Scorpion, and Bismarck. I found the Neuronic, Orang Madon, and Lord Spencer. We'll probably find a couple of wrecks on this trip, too. Robert was a man Brock had the utmost respect and admiration for. Not just because the man had managed to find wrecks like the Titanic, Yorktown, Bismarck, Scorpion, and others long after they were lost, but he had many of the same views Brock had grown to have after studying so many wrecks. Robert had truly been one of Brock's inspirations for his passion. I guess the real winner will be who finds the Waratah first, Ballard chuckled. Max nodded. Well, let's just keep it non-controversial this time. Hey, that's what I do. What, you don't appreciate the press's response to us proving the narrative about the Orang Madan wrong? Ballard chuckled. Oh no, that was fun. Messing up established history is always a laugh. The constant phone calls and emails and DMs. Not so much, though, Max replied. Well, we're at the coordinates. Maybe U-116 is just right below us and it'll be a quick and easy job. He turned away from the ocean and put a hand on Max's shoulder. We're not going to find her sitting up here. Let's get started. So what's the plan? Sarah asked when they rejoined the others in the lab. We'll start scanning the ocean floor here and begin moving back west, and from there start working our way out in a widening spiral. Not the most 
orthodox way of looking for something? Max commented. Yeah, I know, Brock said, but I'd wager U-116 is probably closer to her last known position than she is the outermost radius of the first search area. We're going to keep the spiral tight and make sure we image the entire ocean floor as we go around. We're not going to have any gaps when we're done. You all know what to look for. Let's get to it. He went to one of the phones on the lab's wall and pulled it off the receiver, calling up the bridge. When someone answered, Ballard guessed it was the second officer given the broken English and the Swedish accent. He asked, This is Ballard in the lab. Is the captain on the bridge? Captain Phillips came on the line after a moment, and Ballard said, You know our plan, Captain. Let's get started. We're going to start scanning the ocean floor. We need to get the sonar in line, and then we'll head back to the west. We're going to conduct a multi-beam sonar survey from the ship. If anything on the seafloor comes up of interest, or that could be a candidate for the wreck, we're going to stop and drop a sub in the water to check it out. Captain Phillips confirmed that he understood, but before Ballard hung up, he added, Hey, let us know if any other ships start heading our way. He didn't know how far along Russia's planned search was, if one was even being planned, but he at least wanted a warning if they were about to turn up. A search for the Navy was one thing, but Ballard was not going to risk his team's lives for it. I'm not going to risk my team's lives for this, or your crew. If some of the other interested parties turn up and aren't going to play nice, we are out of here. Just let me know if anyone appears and is making a beeline for us. Within minutes, the survey of the ocean floor had begun, and the grainy image of outlines that made up the features of the ocean floor was streamed to everyone's laptops. There was nothing immediately below them that was man-made. The vessel began moving back to the west, and the team began monitoring the ocean floor, noting everything they saw, watching for any sign of anomalies or obvious man-made objects lying down there. The hours began to pass, then days, and that status remained unchanged. As they put miles behind them and expanded their search, there was no sign of U-116 or any shipwrecks at all below them. And that was the very slow part of their job, the waiting, watching a scanned image of the ocean floor slowly slide by on a computer screen while you looked for something specific. There might have been hundreds of thousands of wrecks laying across the North Atlantic, but the ocean was still bigger, and they were far between. Truly, the rare oases in the desert, the ocean floor was proving over and over that fact to be true. But... They had planned to search for a 50-mile radius in all directions of U-116's last recorded position. No one expected to find her on day one. By day seven, that still hadn't changed. Other than a few geologic anomalies and some wrecks that were definitely not U-boats, which they had merely marked the coordinates for and moved on, not able to investigate now, there was no sign of the lost submarine. It was on day seven that Max suddenly jumped up from his seat in the lab as he gazed at his laptop screen. We have an anomaly on the seafloor, he suddenly reported. Ballard ran over and almost jumped onto the table to get as close a look as he could at the object. Some of the others hurried over and peeked over Ballard's shoulder. What is it, Ballard? One of the team's archaeologists asked. Ballard shook his head. I don't know, he said, getting as close to the screen as he could and squinting. Sure ain't another Eltinian antenna, though. Can you clear that up? Brock requested, pointing at the screen. I can try, Max replied. Max pulled the laptop close, typed a few commands, and worked his magic. Good. Sharpen it. I want to see the shape and any features as clearly as we can, Ballard requested. Max continued typing some prompts into his computer. The image quality sharpened, and Ballard felt a jolt hit him. He tapped the screen. That's a U-boat, he said. Look at the length, the shape of the bow. See the conning tower? That is a U-boat. He stared at the screen for a few moments, but then realized the live image was still panning along the screen as the Domina Libertitis began to move past the spot, like an eclipse passing totality. Shit, he jumped, pulling out a walkie-talkie Captain Phillips had given him, and he spoke into it. Captain, you there? We have something. Stop the ship. Phillips's voice came back over the radio and affirmed Ballard's request. You think it's the right one? Someone behind Ballard asked. A crowd had formed there. By now, the entire team had come over to have a look at the laptop screen. A few of the apparently curious crew had wandered in too following the commotion and were watching from behind the team. 
Brock shook his head. I don't know, but it very well could be. We're in the right neck of the woods. Let's get a sub in the water and get it down there. Mo, Curly, that's us, Dave said. Soon, one of the unmanned submarines given to the team by the Navy had splashed down into the water and was descending to the ocean floor. The blue void of the ocean around it slowly turning into a pitch black abyss. And now the team was playing the waiting game again. It would take hours for the sub to reach the target. And until then, they only had a pixelated image on screen to look at and wonder if it was their desired U-boat or not. And God said, let there be light, Dave said, flicking the button on the control panel for the sub that turned its exterior floodlights on. The live feed being broadcast back to the team in the lab suddenly turned from pitch black to a view of the ocean floor illuminated in bright white beams. From the control room, Dave radioed the lab. Target is six meters ahead. You should see her in the light any time. Thanks, Dave. Brock said into the handset as he and the others intently gazed at the screen. Captain Phillips had joined them, and a few of the crew were still hanging around as well, all under the impression that one of the shipwrecks of historical significance the team were looking for might have just been found and interested to see it. The base of a small rocky outcropping came into view in the live feed, and then the eerie shape of the bow of the U-boat lying on its starboard side illuminated in the ghostly light. Look at that, Max said, somewhat awestruck. Ballard's mouth was open. She's in incredible condition. We're taking her up over the bow. We'll see if we can identify her, Damien said over the radio. The team watched as the live feed showed the sub glide up and rise over the wreck, passing over the bow. What do you think, Max said. Ballard shook his head. I'm not an expert on U-boats. I don't know if that's a Type XB or any other kind. Didn't they show you what she looked like? Sarah asked. They showed me what a Type XB looks like, but if I'm honest, it looked no different to me than any other U-boat. I know a few U-boats that went missing in World War II off the top of my head, but I can't tell the difference between different classes of them at a glance, Brock said. I never really read much about it. The sub was now passing along the length of the body of the U-boat, shining light upon her intact hull. Not a hole was to be seen. It just looked like she dropped to the ocean floor. Conning tower is closed. Cannon is gone. I don't know, Ballard admitted. He lifted the radio to his mouth again. Hey, can you guys try to get us a good shot of the bow? That's where the identification numbers will be, if they're still there. The sub moved back towards the bow, slowly passing over the wreck. And as it did, Ballard took in all the details, and then he exhaled between clenched teeth. Shit. What? Max asked. Ballard nodded towards the screen. I think this one is too short. They continued watching the feed as the sub moved towards the tip of the bow, and soon it appeared out of the gloom. The sub pulled up and angled itself to shine her lights down on the side of the bow, and there, still looking like they were just painted on yesterday, was the U-boat's identification number. Ballard sighed and took a step back. It's U-381. She disappeared in the mid-Atlantic south of Greenland in 1943. Never would have thought to find her this far south in the North Atlantic, but there she is, and it's not the one we want. Everyone was disappointed. Hours had been lost on what proved a fruitless harvest. Okay, people, it's part of the job. Let's keep going. Get the sub back up and on the ship and mark where U-381 is. One day we might have a chance to do a proper examination of the wreck, Brock said. Everyone nodded and went to carry out their orders. It's not her, Brock was saying in his radio to Dave, David, and Damien. Get the sub back up and get back up here. Copy that, boss, Dave replied. How many U-boats have gone missing? Alex asked once he got back to his laptop. Ballard chuckled. You have the internet, he said, and Alex sheepishly nodded and went to look it up. Once he found a list, he counted and then whispered, Damn. Everyone was looking expectantly at him. 46, he said, in World War II alone. Well... It's 45 now, 
Brock said. Any passenger liners you'd like to find one day? Moore asked Ballard that night. They were sitting in the lab together. It was after midnight. Moore was off duty and Ballard was taking the night watch that night. Ballard shrugged. A couple of Inman line ships are on my bucket list. City of Boston, City of Limerick, City of London, City of Glasgow. They didn't have the best luck with their ships. Sounds like they didn't have the most creative names either, Moore chuckled. So what'd you find today? We were stocked for a while, he asked. U-138, or U-381. Sorry, I'm tired. I haven't slept in a day, and I won't get any till six. Someone has to monitor this all night, though, so we're doing it in shifts. Anyway, she disappeared close to Greenland in 1943. Never would have thought she'd be this far south. I really hope it's not a sign the ship we're looking for isn't way outside of its search radius. Would make things a lot harder. What are you guys looking for, anyway? Moore asked. Historically significant wrecks to the U.S. Navy, Ballard replied. The Navy doesn't want the specific ones disclosed unless we find them, he added. Moore nodded and looked at the laptop screen. How deep is that? Over 2,000 meters, Ballard answered. And what is that? Moore asked, pointing at a blob on the screen. Geologic feature, Ballard said. Rocks, pile of boulders. If our geologist was awake, he could tell you. Hmm. Moore nodded, sitting back in his chair. He continued to watch the screen and saw the empty ocean floor continued to pass by. It looked lonely. The ocean floor really is empty, he said. And we're essentially looking for the world's smallest needle inside the world's biggest haystack, Ballard confirmed. They continued to watch the screen in silence for a while. Nothing, not even a stray shipwreck, came into view. So, what was the controversial theory about the galley you said you had? Moore asked after a few minutes. Ballard chuckled and scooted back from the laptop for a moment. How much do you know about maritime history? Not much, Moore said. I know a little bit about math, and I can fix just about anything. But history is something I was never really able to get into, but... I do find it really interesting. Ballard nodded in response, knowing he'd have to give a little context for why his theory was so controversial. I thought it was one of Vandino and Ungulino Vivaldi's missing ships. They left Guinea in 1291, and they were going to attempt to make a voyage to India around Africa. They were never seen again. My theory was, what if they decided to veer from their plan? They realized the coast of Africa is dangerous, and it is. Skeleton Coast is a thing. I proposed that they decided to take the longer but safer route straight over the ocean to India. They didn't know there was a continent in the way, though, and they hit it, and then they died there. A lot of people were up in arms over that one, but it's the only explanation I have for how a ship from the 13th century in the exact same kind of galley they were using to right age, right wood, right everything, ended up off the coast of North America. It was just off the southern coast of Florida, Ballard explained yawning as tiredness threatened to sneak up on him. The first Florida man, Moore said. Ballard snorted as he tried not to burst out laughing. Even if it wasn't them, he said after a moment, someone undertook a grand voyage and history is completely unaware of it. Which is weird to me. Most historians theorize they were lost somewhere along the coast of Africa, but the ship we found was the right, the right kind of ship, and it just makes you wonder. And their expedition was a big deal at the time. I just feel like if a, another similar scale voyage was mounted to go west, then we'd know about it. When Pythias did it, everyone knew about it. Well, maybe one day you'll know for sure. You seem to have a knack for upsetting historians, Moore said. Ballard laughed. <laughs> they never like it when I find something that is agreed to have been a myth. He looked at Moore. Maybe one day we'll know where it came from. It's on a list of ships I've found but still want to identify. Any ocean mysteries you want to see solved someday? Moore asked. Oh, yeah. There are several ships I want to see found, like the SS Waratah. A lot of people have looked for her, me included, and found nothing. Then that early steamship I told you about, the iron one I found on the bottom of the North Atlantic over ten years ago... Still trying to figure out who it is, and after this search is done, that mystery's probably going to be one of my top priorities to solve. What do you think sank her? Moore asked. Ballard shook his head. 
I don't know. The wreck is all kinds of messed up, but I haven't had a chance to study her at all. Could have been a collision with something, or if it was an early steamship, which I do think she is, it could very likely have been an explosion that sank her. They happened all the time on those early steamships, and it would explain how damaged and twisted the wreck is. More whistled. Like I said the other day, those sailors had real guts. Ballard nodded in agreement. Yeah. And since there were so many missing ships from back then, and records are incomplete, we just don't know yet. But somewhere, some family never got closure on where Dad went. Another mystery, and this one's not archaeological, but it's always interested me. Someday I want to take submersibles down to where Upsweep is coming from and see what's causing it. What is that? It's a sound that's been heard on hydrophones since 1991. No one knows what it is. There's theories, and we've traced its origin to a spot in the South Pacific, but no one has gone down there to actually see if they're right. What's the theory, Moore asked. That it's volcanic activity. The sound peaks a few times a year, and its volume has been decreasing, but the sound is still audible. Here, I'll play it, Ballard explained, pulling up a sped-up recording of the sound he had downloaded and playing the file. Sounds almost like a siren or alarm, Moore commented. Ballard nodded. Yep, that's the sped-up version, though. You listen to it at real speed, and it sounds like the screams of the damned, he said, pausing up sweep. Huh, Moore said. So, what was the first ship you ever found? Well, I wasn't there when it was identified, but I did lead the investigation that uncovered the wreck of the white ship. We found a wreck where it sank, but didn't identify it conclusively. Another archaeologist got that honor. Wasn't long after I got out of school was my first investigation, Ballard answered, scooting back from the laptop again and turning to Moore. Now let me hear your story if you're going to keep asking about mine, he chuckled. Well, that's a long one, but we have all night, Moore conceded. One more question first, though. Shoot, Ballard agreed. You ever found any wrecks that you don't know what they are, other than your early steamship, that is? Oh, yeah, Ballard said. Aside from that one, there was another one we spotted on sonar in the South Atlantic, southeast of Africa. I didn't have a chance to go look at it at the time, and I haven't been able to go back, but from the image we got, and the length we calculated, and overall shape, which was easy to see since she was sitting upright, we got a good look at the bow and stern. I think it might be the Copenhagen. Oh shit, really? Moore asked. Ballard looked at him. You know that one? Moore nodded. Hell yeah, I do. You do this career long enough, and those are the stories you inevitably hear. He leaned back in his chair. Damn, you gotta keep me updated on that. Alright, fair is fair. So about me. I started with the Waterman Steamship Corporation about 15 years ago. My parents wanted me to join the Navy, actually. Each of my direct ancestors on my dad's side, father to son, had served in the Navy all the way back to the American Revolution. But it was... Never my calling. They were satisfied if I worked on a ship, and I liked the ocean, so I was fine with that. You see some of the most alien, otherworldly, beautiful, and terrifying things on the ocean, especially at night. You have your weird stories? I have some too. We were closer to shore, but still in the Atlantic a few years ago, and it's dead of dark. Dark, starless night. No moon. And then suddenly, the ocean surface erupted in these bright blue streaks that were zooming around. It was dolphins swimming in bioluminescent algae. I cannot describe the otherworldly look, but simultaneous utter beauty of that. He sighed as he thought about the sight, then continued. Anyway, I was with that company until about 10 years ago when there was this huge stir caused when our ship, this big tanker, got swarmed by pirate skiffs off the Somali coast. Oh shit, you were on that ship? Ballard asked. He remembered hearing about it well. Moore nodded. Oh yeah, second officer at the time. Our captain was killed, the crew scattered all over, and they were hunting us like rats. They didn't want hostages. 
They wanted the cargo to sell and no witnesses. Whoever pays them is getting desperate for more funds, it seems. I rallied a bunch of us up in the engine room where we'd hid, and we fought back. I led a charge out of the engine room. We used axes, pipes, wrenches, fire extinguishers as weapons, so we got some of their guns, found some of the other crew, got them armed, and we retook the ship. Captured the bridge, sent a distress call. U.S. Navy was there in five minutes, blowing the skiffs out of the water. Ballard shook his head at the story. Dang. I knew about that skirmish, but... Wow. So, after that, I left the company, bounced between jobs for a while, and eventually ended up here, Moore said. And I'm happy to say we've never been in that area of the ocean since I did get on here. Thank God. This has been a good one. I like the ship, the captain, the company who owns her doesn't make us run through dangerous sections of the ocean like that, but even out of them you see some scary stuff. Gulf of Alaska a few years ago. We'd been contracted by some biologist team from some university, and in a storm, I saw deadheads, weathered to a point by the ocean waves and wind, jumping out of the waves, way up and plunging down into the water, spiked end first. Those things ever landed on a boat, you're going to be all kinds of fucked up. Other than seeing pirates boarding my skiff, that is one of the scariest things I've ever seen. I still get chills thinking about them. They both were speaking with the same enthusiasm as the other now, two passionate men, each telling the other their best stories. I'll tell you what, call me when you think for half a second you see a plesiosaur swimming in front of your submarine camera, and I'll buy you a beer, Ballard said. Moore laughed. And you call me if you ever see a jumping deadhead, and I'll buy you one. Deal, Ballard said, and they shook hands. The next several days continued to pass without another U-boat sighting, but they weren't as dry as the first week had been. We got another one, Max reported three days after the discovery of the wreck of U-381. It's not a U-boat, but it's a ship. Looks to be good size, too. It's in good shape, too, Ballard said, coming over and looking at the screen. It was a larger ship, judging by the scale of the image on Max's screen and the ship's size relative to it. Look at the shape of the bow. She's probably... He paused, looking at the size of the ship in the image and the scale of the image bouncing back from the sonar scan. She's got to be over 300 feet long, Ballard said. And look at the shape. I think that's a destroyer. He looked up from the screen and around the lab, then pulled his walkie-talkie to his mouth. Captain, this is Brock. Stop the ship. He turned and pointed at Dave, David, and Damien with the walkie's antenna. I know this isn't what we're looking for, but I'm too curious. I want that submarine in the water. I want to know who that is down there. Copy that, Dave said, and the Three Stooges hurried from the room. Brock, Max said. Ballard looked back at him. I know it's not what we're looking for, but... I think that may be one of our Navy ships down there that has never been found. I want to know who it is. Uncle Sam isn't going to like this, Max said. I know we're not supposed to stop and only look for U-116, but I want to have a look anyway. A quick up and down, just like with the Neuronic, Ballard replied. It was the USS Bory DD-215. She was a famous lost ship from the Second World War, having famously run down and sunk U-405, which must have been somewhere nearby, but was crippled in the endeavor. She was then scuttled by friendly fire intentionally. Famously, she had almost appeared to fight back and refuse to go down, but a 500-pound bomb had sealed her fate. She was sunk on November 2nd, 1943, and had never been seen again. At least until the moment that the submarine's lights pierced the darkness and illuminated her hull. The ghostly wreck was lying upright on the ocean floor on an even keel, the area where the bomb had hit a mangled mess of torn and collapsed metal, but her prow was still intact and proud. And now, she had been found again after nearly 100 years. In the lab, the team were awestruck as they watched the camera feed and Max's laptop screen. She was a good ship. Her performance was called Extraordinary at the time. It is a well-known story that she was incredibly hard to sink. It was like she didn't want to be let go after doing her job so well. 
She still looks proud, but disheartened almost. She was able to right herself when she sank and now sits like a sad monument. It's sad to see her like this. She looks sad, Ballard said as he saw her. She didn't want to give up. She was a good ship. Incredible that we found her. There was no time for anything more than a quick pass over the wreck before they hauled the submarine back up, its multi-mile-long tether slowly being reeled in, and the USS Bory, while having been found, was again left in darkness once more. Her coordinates were marked, though. She'd never be lost again, and Ballard already planned to return to her after he revisited the Neuronic. His mystery iron-hauled ship, which was going to be his first expedition after the Neuronic, would have to wait just a little longer for that planned revisit. The lab was silent as everyone watched the Bori, a monument of World War II, vanish into the gloom again in the live feed. Respectful, somber moment of silence. Soon, the sub was back on the ocean surface, hoisted over the stern again, and the Domina Libertatis continued on. Over the next few days, more wrecks were spotted on the sonar image, mangled, twisted, mostly upright ships sitting on the bottom of the ocean, the few to have been found among the literal thousands on the North Atlantic Ocean floor. At one point, what looked like a U-boat had appeared on the sonar image too, but when the sub went down to investigate, they found that the object was merely a nearly perfect U-boat-shaped rock. The team were growing restless. This was the 90% of their job, but it seemed drier than usual. Alex had spent an entire day listening to a live broadcast of all the sounds a hydrophone in the North Atlantic was picking up, hearing marine animals, ships, and a few noises that sounded like roars and the rumble of an active underwater volcano. Ballard spent many hours at a time just staring at the laptop screen, watching the image of the ocean floor pan across the screen. Occasionally, he would shake his head and mutter, Where are you? U-116 never jumped out to answer him, though. She remained elusive. And after those first few days, there weren't even any other wrecks to be seen either, and the Bori was now far behind them. The desert seemed to indeed be one of few oases. Even a pile of rocks would have been welcome. At least it'd be something to look at. On the Domina Libertatis' bridge, meanwhile, the officers were always on watch, as per Captain Phillips' orders. They frequently watched the radar to watch for other ships being in the area or coming at them, but no one was ever around. The ocean was empty all the way to the horizon. They were alone. By the end of the week, something more interesting appeared on radar. Brock! Sarah called, it being her turn to monitor the sonar feed. We got another U-boat! She added as he hurried over. He was there in a flash, gazing at the screen. She was right. The obvious shape of a U-boat was lying on the ocean floor right below them, almost two miles down. If the ocean was crystal clear and light reached to the bottom, they could have looked down over the railing and seen it lying there. We finally found an oasis, Max said, clapping his hands together. Let's hope this one has some water. Just like before, Ballard called the captain to stop the ship, and the submarine was dropped into the water in minutes. Everyone was moving at double speed, finally having a chance to spring after being tightly wound for days. The unmanned submersible sank down to the ocean floor at what felt like an agonizingly slow pace. The suspense everyone felt on if this could be their U-boat was making time feel slower. The submarine's lights were soon turned on and, after what felt like a long time, the ocean floor came into view and the sub began moving over it towards the wreck. The lab was completely silent. Captain Phillips had come down and joined the team, leaving Moore in command of the bridge. Almost tauntingly, due to the sediments being kicked up by the submarine as it passed over the seabed, the outline of the wreck didn't come into view until they were almost on top of it. 
It was like the ocean was teasing them. The sediment simply refused to settle and allow them a glimpse of the wreck they had found and knew was there, but still lurked just out of sight in the murky water. Sarah clenched her fist due to the tension in the room. Please be her, she mumbled. The lights from the sub only illuminated the stirred sediments and mud, creating an effect like car headlights and fog. They did not pierce through it like they did the darkness of the deep sea. They only illuminated the disturbed particles. Finally, a glimpse of the frame of the U-boat appeared out of the gloom as the sub's lights pierced the stirred up sand and mud and touched the hull. She looks like she's the right length, Ballard commented glancing over at the sonar image and looking at the size of the U-boat as the sub crossed the gap between it and its older counterpart. Soon, the sediment settled again, and the outline, the ghostly shape, was fully revealed and came into view from the pitch-black void around the submarine. The sub began to move closer. She's in great shape, Alex said, just like the last one. Don't think they all are. I've been reading about missing U-boats on the chance we find any of them. Some, like... U-338 were completely obliterated, most likely, Max replied, eyes on his laptop screen. From the side the sub was approaching from, they were looking at the keel, the U-boat's belly. She was lying overturned on her side. She definitely looks like she's intact, Ballard agreed. Let's see what the other side looks like, though. Indeed, she was intact. It became obvious as the sub moved closer and glided over the U-boat that her hull was intact and sealed. As the sub rose up and passed over her, her port side came into view, and then the conning tower did. The sub's lights punctured the darkness around the wreck, but the black void of the deep sea was pressing in on all sides as the sub moved over the wreck. The U-boat was lying on her starboard side, partially buried in the mud on the ocean floor. She almost looked new. She was corroded, metal was fused together and rusting, but her hull did not have a single hole in it. Everything inside would likely be preserved, as well as artifacts in an unopened Egyptian's tomb. Not a hole to be seen in the hull. Look at the conning tower, it's intact too. If this turns out to be her, we could probably get inside right there, assuming the interior is as good a shape as the outside, Ballard whispered quietly. The last part of his statement was more of amusing. There was nothing from what the team could see that would immediately identify which U-boat this was. It likely wasn't the one they were looking for, going by just the odds. Ballard lifted his radio to his mouth. Dave, take us to the bow. We have to see if her identification numbers are still there. That'll be the easiest way to identify her, Ballard said into the walkie-talkie. Copy that. Dave's voice came back over the radio. The sub began moving back along the hall, towards the bow. With the tension in the room, the sub seemed to creep along the hall almost agonizingly slow. No one blinked as they watched the live feed of the wreck as the sub moved towards the bow. Everyone watched with bated breath as it slowly came into view, and then as the submarine moved closer. Some of the stooges turned all the exterior lights on and focused their beams on the tip of the bow as the sub moved closer. There are no pictures of U-116 that we know about, so we have to hope the numbers are still visible. That might be the only way to identify her, Ballard said to the others. The sediments built up on the hall were briefly disturbed as the sub passed over the body of the U-boat and obscured the camera, but they quickly settled and the frame reappeared. The numbers were still there, fainter than they had been on the first U-boat, but they were still there and visible on the rusting hall. Everyone leaned forward and stared as the image cleared and the lights focused on them. They stared in silence. It was U-116, the Type XB mine-laying U-boat that had disappeared into thin air on her fourth patrol. She had finally been found, she was missing no longer, and she was in the best condition anyone could have hoped for. Everyone leaned back from the screen and let out a breath that they'd collectively been holding in. U-116's wreck was only about 20 miles west of her last reported position. It was without a doubt 
the missing U-116 that vanished in 1942 without explanation or trace. She had been found. She was intact, sealed up, in one piece, and in perfect condition. There was no obvious reason for why she had sunk, but she had, and had come to rest on that spot, half buried in mud, miles below the surface of the North Atlantic. That's her. I want the whole wreck photographed. We need to see every part of her, Ballard said into the radio, before leaning forward and looking at the long missing U-boat's number. You got it, boss. Damien's voice came back over the receiver, but Ballard wasn't paying attention. His gaze was locked on the finally found U-116. Normally he could read or get a feel from a wreck, but this one was different. Cold. What is she telling you, Brock? Max asked. Ballard just shook his head as he gazed at U-116's still visible numbers and said, Nothing. She's dead. All right, Ballard said several hours later, once the wreck had been fully surveyed. Their sub was still down alongside it. Now, everyone on the entire team were gathered at the table in the lab, along with Captain Phillips. I know we're tired. Some of us haven't slept in 24 hours, but it's only early afternoon, so let's see if we can get what we came for out of the U-boat today, and the less time we hang around here, the less risk to us. Ballard typed something on his laptop briefly and sent a composite image of the wreck to everyone before continuing. So, we found U-116, confirmed she is intact, and it's very likely, given her condition, that the artifact we're looking for inside is also in relatively good condition. Now, we need to decide how we want to go about retrieving it. Floor is open, he said, facing everyone and waiting. Well, she's in good condition, structure seems intact, and dare I say sturdy, we can Probably cut her open and get inside easily enough, Dave suggested, standing up and going up to the whiteboard, pointing at a printed-off picture of the conning tower taped to it. A still frame from the video taken of the submersible's live feed. We can cut in through the hatch, send the smaller ROV down along the ladder and into the wreck to examine the interior. The thing has arms, so if we find something we need to move, or even better, what we're looking for, we can pull it right out. Will the ROV be able to do that? Alex asked. Dave nodded. It has grappling arms on it. As long as the object isn't too big, it could get out, attach itself back to the maid sub, and we pull it to the surface. I'd be worried about it coming loose and dropping. We'd never find it again, Sarah commented. We have those cranes on the back of the ship. You saw that the hull is intact, so why don't we pull the whole thing back to the surface? One crane can hoist the submersibles we have on board out of the water, so maybe both can pull the U-boat up. Then we can refloat it, drain the water, and go inside ourselves and find it. I don't think the cranes we have on board could pull that feet off, Max replied. U-116 would be significantly heavier than the two subs we have combined. Not to mention, we don't know how fragile the wreck is. She might hold together, or might come apart if we try to move her. Then we have a bigger problem. At least she's intact, and we know where the target is. It's inside, not on the ocean floor, Brock said next. As much as he loved the idea of raising the wreck and actually getting to see the inside of one he had found and touch it, he knew that wasn't an option here. Even if this was one that could feasibly maybe be done with the right equipment. Captain Phillips spoke up next. You say she's almost 300 feet long and several thousand tons? The cranes would never pull her up. The cables would snap, or the cranes would, but they would never get her up. Plus, those pictures you showed me show she's buried deep in the mud. It would take more than just cranes to get her loose. You need explosives just to jar her loose. The mud is thick and strong. It'll hold her like a vacuum. Well, we don't have explosives anyway, Max replied. So it sounds like we have to go inside, Ballard said. That shouldn't be too bad if the interior is as in good of shape as the exterior, Max commented. But we are not the submarine pilots either. Mo, Larry, Curly, what do you think? Well, those old submarines were known for their, I'll just say it, claustrophobic interiors. It's gonna be tight, 
But from what I've researched about these types of U-boats, I think we could do it with the ROV, Damien said. There's gonna be a thousand places we could get it stuck, though, Dave added. Newly built? Claustrophobic is still the best way to describe the interior of one of these things. Very small. Very tight conditions. Barely enough room to squeeze past someone in the main hallway. One that's been sitting as a ruin on the bottom of the ocean for almost a hundred years? After sinking for reasons we still don't know, the interior might be a mess. Or unstable, David added. Well, first step is determining if the weapon was on board, and if it was, what condition it is in. You're right, it might have been obliterated. We won't know until we get her open and find it in there, Ballard said. We can attach that torch the Navy gave us to the second sub. That thing has some power. It's like a lightsaber. We take the second sub down, cut in through the hatch on the conning tower. The first sub moves in towards the new opening. We detach the small ROV from its belly and it goes in. We evaluate from there, Dave suggested. Brock nodded. I like that. Any objections? No one shook their heads. They had never gone inside a wreck as small as this one would be, but everyone knew it was the only option they had. They had to cut open U-116 to find the secrets she was hiding inside her wreck. Seeing no objections, Ballard's mouth compressed into a determined line. Let's do it. The second submersible joined the first one at the wreck site of U-116, its bright lights flicking on and forcing the dark, oppressing void of the deep ocean back as it came alongside the U-boat. Deploying arms, Dave said once it reached the top of the conning tower. The hatch, closed and rusted shut, was thankfully still above the muddy floor of the ocean. A long, thin arm with a torch on the end reached out from the submersible, extending out to the hatch. Inside the control room, David flipped a switch and placed his hands on the trigger. A bright, sun-like spike of light erupted from the end of the torch. Dave whistled. <whistles> Oxygen cutting is a hell of a thing, he said watching on the camera feed as the glowing torch began to immediately cut through the rusting metal of the U-boat's hatch. Don't talk, I need to focus. We don't want to cause any more harm to the wreck than is needed, David said, gently guiding the torch along the edge of the hatch with the controls in front of him. Up in the lab, everyone on the team, along with Captain Phillips, watched the process. Phillips' second officer was now in command of the ship up on the bridge, taking charge of the watch. Let's just hope the inside isn't collapsed, or even that the conning tower is blocked off inside by something, Damien said. Everyone's attention was locked on the cutting process, feeling apprehension rise inside them. One problem at a time, David answered him distractedly, his focus on guiding the torch. They'd found U-116 against all the odds, but what were they going to find inside her? As soon as the torch had gone around the exterior of the entire hatch, it immediately slid free and slumped down to the ocean floor, stirring up a small cloud of settlements as it settled. The torch flicked out, and the second submersible moved back, allowing the first to approach. The lights from the sub punctured the inside of the opening, looking down inside the conning tower, the first time light had touched the interior of the U-boat since she sank. In the lab... Everyone could only see just inside the opening of the tower, a very tentative glimpse of the inside of the U-boat. Had he been superstitious, Ballard would have half expected to see a ghostly or skeletal hand suddenly reach out towards the subs now that the wreck had been disturbed, but obviously nothing was there. A constant rumbling and roaring sound coming from Alex's computer did not help alleviate the tension in the room, nor anyone's nerves or apprehension. Alex, turn that hydrophone livestream off, Max said. Alex, looking slightly flustered, having forgotten about it, hurried over and muted his laptop speakers and hurried back, his face slightly red. In the live feed from the submersible, they could see its lights shining down into the tower, illuminating a ladder going further down into the darkness of the U-boat's interior. With the hatch cut open, Dave spoke into his radio. Detaching the ROV now. The smaller robot detached from its housing compartment in the larger submersible's belly. It was bulky, 
painted red with lights, a camera, and extendable arms folded against itself it could grab or grapple with, along with a tether that attached it to the larger submersible. But the body was streamlined and compact enough it could squeeze inside the tight interiors of the U-boat's tower and get down to the slightly wider depths of the wreck further inside, if only just, as long as it hadn't deteriorated much. Since she had been completely sealed up, everyone was hopeful the interior would be nearly perfectly preserved. The little robot's propellers powered up and it slid over to the open hatch and squeezed inside. Sliding right through the hatch and propelling itself down into the tower. At the bottom of the ladder, the capsized interior of the U-boat turned left and right, right heading towards the bow and left towards the stern. We're seeing a place human beings haven't seen in almost a century, Ballard whispered feeling awed like he always did when a new wreck was explored for the first time. Uh, Brock, any suggestions? Dave asked over the radio. This place might as well be a hedge maze. I don't know where to start looking. Typical. Didn't even read the schematics, Alex said. It's fine, Ballard said, lifting the radio to his mouth. We'll search the control room first. You should be in it, he replied. If it's not there, we'll try the crew quarters next. The control room is right under the conning tower. The crew quarters will be forward. Copy that, Dave said. The little ROV moved around the old control room, its lights illuminating the walls and old controls as it maneuvered through the flooded room. Dave and the others having to be careful not to get the tether tangled around anything. The last thing they needed was the ROV getting stuck inside the wreck. All the objects lying on the floor, or rather on the wall since the U-boat was on its side, were piled up together in a mess. There was nothing that matched what they were looking for to be seen. However, what they did see, which filled a few members of the team with a feeling of deep pits in their guts, were pairs of boots lying together side by side amid the mess of objects. Doesn't take a genius to tell us what that is, Dave said to the others in the control room with him. They nodded silently to each other. I bet if we were to dig around in that pile, we'd find some bones, too, David agreed. After they'd searched the entire room, Dave grabbed his radio and said into it, Yeah, Brock, it's not here. There's just a whole lot of nothing in here. Crew quarters and storage next, Brock replied. It's up forward. It took a moment for Damien to work out which direction in the sideways wreck was forward from his camera alone, but after a minute he figured it out and moved the ROV deeper into the wreck, out of the control room, and forward towards the bow. The hallway it moved into was much tighter and more restrictive than the control room had been. U-116's guts were growing much more narrow the further inside the wreck the ROV traveled. There was hardly enough room for the crew to have moved side by side through the halls. It was hard to picture sailors once hurrying through these conditions, especially in a combat situation where they'd need to be fast. Particles drifted in the water, sediments being disturbed by the motion of the little robot as it prowled through the U-boat. The ROV passed long extinguished lights with bulbs still intact, personal artifacts lying on the floor, which had actually been the wall, old valves and pipes, open doorways, and tight, rusting, claustrophobic interiors. I don't get what sank her. She's perfectly intact on the inside, too. It's like she just dropped from the surface like a rock, Max said. Maybe she did, Sarah commented. Alex nodded. Ballast issue, maybe? Started flooding and the crew couldn't stop it? I'd say she suffered a complete mechanical system failure, Brock commented. Why, I don't know. We might never, but... I'd guess she just shut down and sank before the crew could fix it. That's one of the most terrifying things I can imagine, Max said. As the ROV moved through the hallway, they saw additional pairs of boots lying together. Had to be a complete mechanical system failure, Ballard said after a moment. She clearly wasn't attacked, has no damage. It's like her heart just gave out and she sank. Everyone trapped inside, miles below the surface. She had to have flooded near the surface, otherwise she would have imploded. 
Max added as everyone went back to watching the screen. The crew quarters who came into view. The RV halted above the door, which was underneath it, and turned and made its way inside and down, past rows of empty, tight bunk beds that were packed together like sardines in a can, one on top of the other, with only enough room to squeeze inside to sleep. A pile of messy debris was at the bottom of the sideways room, piled on the wall. Personal effects left behind by the crew. Some rusty handguns, pairs of shoes, old rotting items that couldn't be made out, what looked like picture frames, tangled objects that were impossible to determine what they were, all covered in a very thick layer of sediment. And almost perfectly in the center of the pile was a small rectangular box between two to three feet tall and long again and about a foot wide. Ballard leaned forward towards the screen. What is that, he said. He pulled his radio to his lips. Damien, get the ROV closer to that box. You got it, boss. Damien's voice replied from the receiver. The ROV moved closer, but the box was partially covered by debris. Get some of that stuff off it, Brock said into the walkie. Damien activated the ROV's arms and they reached out to the pile, grabbing onto some of the tangled objects and pulling them aside. Careful, Brock said as the ROV pulled the delicate items aside, kicking up long, undisturbed sediments. Nothing came apart, and Damien pulled everything aside before the cloud completely obscured the camera view, then had to wait for the silt to clear away again. Once it settled, the box was uncovered and revealed. Holy shit, Ballard gasped, feeling a rush of adrenaline hit him. That's it. That's gotta be it. You sure? Max Hall asked. It matches exactly how the weapon was described to me, and I've never seen Anything like that in a World War II era wreck, Ballard answered. He pulled the radio to his mouth. Damien, get that out of there and get it up to the surface. If it's not what we're looking for, well, we know where U-116 is and we can go back and keep searching the wreck. But I think we have it. Copy, boss, Damien said. He looked over at Dave and David and they all laughed and clapped their hands in excitement before Damien went back to controlling the ROV. He moved it closer and reached the arms out. After a few tense moments, he was able to get them to hook onto the metal box, and he gently lifted the prototype weapon. It caused a cloudy mess of disturbed sediments as it lifted free, rising from the spot it had sat in for almost a century, leaving a hole in the debris pile behind. They had it. Now I gotta back that ass out of the wreck, Damien muttered. Damn it. Trying to get it in was hard enough. The ROV slowly moved backwards, Damien being careful not to bump or scrape against the beds or walls. Ever so gently, he muttered in his half-sing-song voice. Painstakingly slowly, he traced his route back through the wreck to the control room. Going slow to keep from dropping the device, and then he angled upwards and piloted the ROV back out of the conning tower the prototype still safely clutched in its claws. Ever so gently, he sang again. The ROV made it out and back to the larger submersible and reattached to the belly of the larger robot, safely tucking the prototype up inside with it. Alex jumped and clapped his hands. Yes, we have it, he shouted. Everyone started laughing and clapping. Good job, Damien. No one will... Ever call you Curly again, Brock said into the handset. In the control room for the subs, Damien looked over at Dave and David. Eat that, boys, he teased. In the lab, everyone was still clapping one another on the shoulders and laughing. They'd done it. As a team, they had found the long-lost U-boat. They had entered and against all odds received a secret weapon from deep within its guts. They were so caught up in the excitement of the robot pulling the artifact from the wreck that no one noticed some of the crew had wandered into the lab with them while they were exploring the wreck and were standing behind them. And no one noticed the gun. Not until the first shot was fired and one of the team's historians fell dead to the floor with a bullet hole in the back of his skull. Everyone whipped around and saw several of the crew members pulling out pistols they had kept concealed until that moment. Captain Phillips tried to step forward and speak, 
but one of the armed individuals raised his weapon and shot him without even speaking a word. Then, they aimed their guns at everyone else. Go! Max shouted, and everyone scattered, jumping over the counters and ducking down as they bolted for the only door out of the lab. And more gunshots rang out as soon as they moved. The laptop they'd been watching shattered as a bullet tore through the screen. Ballard vaulted over the countertop and into the aisle on the other side as plastic pieces from the laptop rained down around him. He crawled on all fours between the rows of the counters, keeping the road to his left between him and the people shooting until he got closer to the door. Once he reached the end of the row, right next to the door, he stood and ran out, keeping low, one of the last to escape the room. Sarah and Alex were right outside. Alex reached for Ballard to help him up as he made it out of the room, but he waved him off. Go! Go! Scatter! Alex nodded and he and Sarah ran down the hall, taking a turn to the right. Ballard ran straight. In the lab, several armed men rushed out but found the hallway empty. One of them shouted something and they fanned out to look for those who had made it out. In the room behind them, three lay dead, including Max Hall. After shouting for everyone to run, he'd turned to do the same only for the next several shots to be fired at him, and he fell. His mouth was open, he lay on his stomach, and he had three bullet holes in his shoulder, blood pooling around his upper body. As he'd hit the floor, he'd taken one last breath in, and then died. After the initial gunfire, everyone else ducked behind the counters and dove for cover and managed to crawl or run from the room. In the control room, Dave, David, and Damien were confused. No one was responding to their radios. Brock? Dave asked into his radio, but still got no answer. Suddenly, the door to the control room burst open and three armed men with pistols pushed inside and shouted and aimed at the three controlling the submersible. The stunned men instinctively put their hands up. One of the men holding them at gunpoint gestured with his pistol at the controls and said in broken English, Get. It. Up. Now. Dave nodded. Okay. Okay, he said. Not sure what else to say. Outside, they could hear gunshots ringing out across the ship and felt their stomachs drop all the way to the ocean floor. Oh god, is everyone dead? Dave thought. What the fuck just happened? With three armed men aiming at the back of his head, he started to bring the sub back to the surface. It, it's gonna take a few hours, he said shakily. Get it up. The man repeated. First Officer Dylan Moore had been relieved of duty by the second officer and was reading in his quarters when he first heard a series of pops come from outside the room. He closed his book and went to the door, peeking out into the hallway to investigate. A few more pops sounded and he immediately realized they were gunshots. Feeling like a really bad nightmare had just come back to haunt him, he left the room and slowly made his way to the nearby four-way intersection just down the hall, keeping close to the wall. He didn't see anyone, but the gunfire was close. As he approached the intersection, he paused and grabbed a fire axe off its stand on the wall and held it tightly as he approached the junction. Seeing no one ahead, he peeked around the corner and down the hallway to his right and saw a man with a pistol peeking into a room just down the hall pulled his head back and raised the axe over his shoulder like he was holding a bat. He waited until the man stepped into the intersection. As soon as the tip of the man's nose was visible around the corner, Moore swung the axe. Moore buried the blade in the man's face, who had just enough time to look surprised. His wide-eyed expression remained frozen on his face as he slumped down, axe embedded in his skull, the blade embedded between his nose and eyes. Disgusted, Moore released his grasp on the improvised weapon as the man slumped down and stepped forward to look at the body. It was one of the new hires, one of the last minute replacements for the old crew. Really being reminded of the pirate attack now, Moore reached down and grabbed the pistol from the man's limp hand and checked the clip and chamber. It hadn't been fired yet. This man hadn't been doing the shooting. He snapped the clip back into the weapon and chambered around. Right then, he heard screaming and looked down the hallway straight ahead. He saw another man drag a woman out of one of the labs on her knees, one of the people from Ballard's team. Moore watched as he set her up and shot her point-blank range in the face. 
A moment later, the man looked up and spotted Moore, who, at that exact moment, raised the pistol he took up to his eye, aimed, and fired a single shot in one fluid motion. There was a loud bang and a small puff of smoke as the pistol discharged one bullet. The armed man was bringing his weapon up as the bullet struck him in the chest, and he tumbled backwards onto the floor and didn't move. Once he was sure the man was dead, Moore lowered the gun and patted the first man down for more clips. He found three more hidden in the man's belt. He then went to the second man and did the same thing, finding the same number of clips, before taking the second man's pistol and hurrying down the hall for a door that would take him out on deck. He had to see what was happening on deck, then he could make a plan. Like with the pirates from years before, he had an advantage, a valuable one. He knew his ship, the intruders, did not. None of those on board knew it, but their ship had been attacked by an undercover squadron of the secret Russian special military ops group known as Pokhetitele Boga, a paramilitary force who were officially trained by Russian military officials as special ops soldiers would have been a more accurate description, because they weren't officially a special ops unit. Russia had never publicly admitted the group, who were essentially trained terrorists, existed and were part of their military though the world knew it. They had been formed during the late 1950s as a part of an operation to hunt for an ancient Indian religious relic Joseph Stalin had been searching for before his death. One that would supposedly give whoever had it the literal power of gods, which was what their name referenced, snatching power straight from the gods. In his insanity, Stalin believed they could find it if it existed, and it would give the Soviet Union the power it needed to hold all the cards against America, and render mad ineffective. They never found anything, but in the decade since, the group had not been dissolved, but instead were used for one of the most secretive, or sometimes implausible sounding, operations or searches around the world. The group looked like a special forces unit on paper, but were essentially nothing more than a paramilitary extremist group of soldiers trained to be terrorists, pirates, assassins, guerrilla fighters, investigators, hunters of the impossible, and do secret missions in any terrain possible from jungles to tundra or ships at sea to kill political rivals, search and recover objects of interest, or other such secret tasks. They did the dirty jobs that, if caught... Russia could deny any involvement with, since they weren't technically part of their military, but rather an independent entity that merely shared their interest. Something along that would be how they described them if they were ever forced to publicly admit the paramilitary organization existed. The Domina Libertatis was an unarmed ship, and none of her crew were issued any kind of weapon at all, something their attackers took full advantage of. The Russian intelligence agencies had done their own work, and thanks to spies, had learned that Brock Ballard was in fact leading a search for U-116 on behalf of the United States, and they were looking for the weapon hidden inside of it, and not just the wreck. They had scrambled to act. They'd made several crew members of the ship he and his team contracted disappear, and then slipped 30 members of, of the Pokhetitele Boga group in to replace them. It had worked and their agents were hired by the panicked company to replace the sudden mass walkout of 30 of their crew members. Now the group ran through the ship, searching in all the hiding nooks and corners they could find, hunting down the scattered crew and researchers, dragging them up on deck if they didn't kill them outright, and executing them. They were only armed with small handguns, weapons they could hide on their persons at all time until the moment when they struck. Their commanders believed that since the research vessel was unarmed, nothing more would be needed. The Russian troops' plan had been simple, and it was starting exactly as they hoped. As soon as the artifact was found, take control of the ship. As soon as the command went out, several of them stormed the bridge and gunned down everyone up there, including the second and third officers. They then shut off all communications from the ship and began searching it, and once they had the weapon from the U-boat, they intended to leave the vessel with no one alive on board, staging the scene to look like a pirate attack, where some of the passengers and crew were killed, and then the others taken. The Americans, and other governments, would then waste time looking for them, or waiting for a ransom. Meanwhile, Poket Hitale Boga would slip away with their prize. From there, the ship would be left drifting as a ghost ship, with no working communications, to either disappear, 
or be found a few weeks or even years later completely empty or eventually sink with no one ever knowing what happened while they escaped with the prototype their government desired. Since the paramilitary group were fanatics and only wanted to see Russian domination of the world, they were more than happy to do such services for the regime. At least that was their plan, and so far it had worked exactly as intended, save for the fact that now several members of the crew and archaeologist team were scattered and hiding all over the vessel. They'd hoped to catch them before they could do so, but they'd scattered right away and managed to warn others. The guerrilla team began hunting through the ship to find them all. Ballard was on deck, ducked underneath one of the port side stairwells that ran up the side of the ship's superstructure towards the bridge. He couldn't believe what had happened. Not a month before, he'd been looking down at a long lost steamship, and now he was hiding under a staircase on another ship as people with guns searched the ship and killed everyone they found. He hoped the crew on the bridge had sent out an SOS because if they hadn't, everyone on board was likely screwed. He suddenly felt a hand grab his shoulder and whipped around with a yell, only for more to urgently silent him with a finger to the lips. Ballard swore as the adrenaline surge passed through him and he and Moore ducked down under the stairwell together. Damn it! Ballard swore under his breath. Don't do that! I thought I was a dead man. We both might be, Moore whispered. What the hell happened? I was in my quarters and heard gunshots. I go out in the hall and some of our mates are gunning people down. I don't think they're your mates, Ballard muttered, wiping the sweat off his brow. And I don't know. We found the wreck we were looking for. He hesitated, and then decided to, under the circumstances, he should tell more everything. And we retrieved an object from inside of it the United States Navy wanted recovered. Then these guys pulled guns and started shooting. The Navy wanted something. That's what you were looking for? Moore asked looking over his shoulder and back down the deck. Thankfully, it was empty. Yeah, it was top secret. The only one on the ship who knew was Captain Phillips, Ballard explained. Apparently, these guys did too, Moore grumbled, looking back over his shoulder again. Ballard nodded and continued. The Navy wanted us to find a missing German submarine from World War II, U-116, because it apparently had a prototype weapon on it. They wanted it found, we found it, recovered it, and then these gentlemen pulled weapons on us. Several of my team, he trailed off. He didn't know who all was dead, but guessed it was more than one by now. He couldn't believe what he had gotten them into. One dying was too much. He always valued his team's safety over everything else. No one on his team had ever died, not even on research missions to the most hazardous of wrecks or areas, and it hit him hard. He was brought back to reality by Moore putting a hand on his shoulder and jumped slightly. Sorry, Moore said, taking his hand back apologetically. Just, we can't stay here. We have to move. These guys are all over the ship, and so are your team and the crew. We have to find them and the captain and make an effort to get the ship back. The captain is dead. Ballard said in a hollow voice. Moore stared at him. And the chief officer? Ballard shook his head. I don't know. Moore swallowed the saliva in his mouth, knowing that he was as good as in command of the ship now. He let out a deep breath and nodded. <sighs> okay, same principle. We find your team, the crew, and fight these assholes. He reached back behind his back and pulled out the second pistol he'd stashed in his belt and handed it out to Ballard. It's loaded and ready, he said, handing it to Ballard. You know how to use it? Ballard nodded and took the weapon, checked that a bullet was in the chamber, and then checked the safety. I grew up in rural Ohio. Hell yeah, I do, Ballard replied. In a tiny little town where everyone, their mother, and disgruntled aunt had a gun. You grew up in the middle of bumfuck Ohio, huh? Moore said. Ballard shook his head and then chuckled. <laughs> yep. North of Cincinnati on the west side of the state. He laughed again. Despite the seriousness of the situation, it felt good to have a laugh. Under pressure, people sometimes found the strangest ways to relieve some of the stress. Okay, let's go. I have more clips, so take these, Moore spoke after a few seconds. 
He passed half of the clips he had over to Ballard, and then the two, now both armed, held their pistols ready and crept out from under the stairwell. The area was still clear as they set off towards the bow, though they could hear gunshots popping off here and there around the ship. From what I've seen, these guys only have pistols, Moore whispered, going in front. That would make sense. They couldn't sneak anything bigger on board or hide anything larger on themselves, Ballard agreed. This is an unarmed ship. None of the crew had weapons. They wouldn't need anything bigger to take it over. They made their way towards the main deck and stopped just out of sight, peeking out when they heard several voices shouting. What they saw chilled them both. Several members of Ballard's team and the ship's actual crew were standing at the starboard side of the ship their hands behind their heads, with four of the armed intruders standing behind them, shouting in Russian. Then one of them stepped forward to the line, raised the pistol to the back of the person at the end of the line's head, and fired. The others screamed as the one who'd been shot, one of the crew, tumbled over the side and fell into the water. The armed man stepped to the next person and went to do the same. The next victim was Sarah. Ballard could even tell from behind, and he had seen enough. Without speaking to Moore about what he was about to do, he came out from behind his and Moore's cover, raised his pistol, and fired. The man who'd been about to shoot Sarah tumbled back with a gurgling splutter as the bullet ripped into his throat. Moore came out behind Ballard as the other three would-be assassins turned and the officer and archaeologist both opened fire at them together. They hadn't expected anyone but themselves to be armed and were taken off guard and, before they'd had a chance to react, they all lay dead on the deck. The others who had been about to be executed turned around, stunned to be alive. Sarah, who had tear streaks running down her face, saw Ballard and wailed and threw herself into his arms and sobbed there, shaking. Ballard had never seen her so scared. He gently patted her on the back to soothe her. Who are they? She eventually asked. Ballard shook his head. I don't know, he admitted. Moore hurried past him and checked everyone else, then checked the bodies, passing out a weapon to everyone who had been standing on the side of the ship. Sarah was the only exception, not because she was still shaking from nearly being shot, but because there were only four pistols and five people who had been saved from being killed. She seemed to almost be in shock anyway, and Ballard wondered if the poor girl, who was usually so strong, could even bring herself to use a weapon in her current state. Okay, Moore said once the weapons had been distributed. This is not a situation I ever wanted to be in again, but here we are. <sighs> Listen up. There were 30 last-minute replacements, so we can assume 30 of these assholes. Four we shot here, plus two more I killed inside means we can assume there's 24 more of them on board. We're going to find who is left of our crew and Ballard's team, get them armed up as best we can with melee weapons like axes or knives from the kitchen if need be, and stop these assholes. There's... there's... three of them holding Dave, David and Damien at gunpoint, Sarah said, her voice still shaky. I ran there thinking I could hide with them and ran into them. What are they doing, Ballard asked. They're making them bring up the weapon. Sarah replied. We can't let them get it, and Dave is a good shot too. We'll go there first, Ballard said, looking at Moore, who nodded. The group crept along the deck and approached the door to the control room. They gathered outside, and those with weapons took positions around it, aiming at the closed door. Ballard was in the front. It was his team members inside. He'd go in first. Moore took a position to pull the door open and nodded. Ballard did too, raised his weapon, and Moore pulled the door open. Ballard and the others stormed inside and opened fire at the armed men inside. They'd likewise been caught off guard and were taken down quickly. One had gotten a shot off, but it had been high. Stunned, Dave and the others stood up as Ballard hurried to them. Are you guys okay? he asked. Dave nodded in relief. We're fine, he said, his voice slightly hoarse. Ballard patted him on the shoulder in relief. A sudden shout came from outside, and one of the armed crew members jumped, looking outside. Shit, we've been seen! Everyone who had guns crowded around the door and began firing at the paramilitary men, several of whom were rushing at them from further forward up the deck. The soldiers returned fire. One of the Dominia Libertatis' crew members fell dead to the control room floor. 
Moore was next by the door. He leaned out, quickly found a target, and fired, avenging his fellow crewmen. By now, the paramilitary groups had stopped rushing the door and had taken cover. Bullets pelted the control room doorway and doorframe. Several of those inside ducked away from it as the skirmish continued. Ballard peeked out of the doorway as the gunfire continued and saw one of the armed men outside speaking into a radio. Shit, they're gonna call in the cavalry, he said, leaning out of the door and returning fire. He didn't hit anyone and ducked back inside as several bullets struck the place he'd been peeking out from a moment before. There's four, maybe five of them out there now, he said. They've got us pinned in. These guys are trained good, Moore added. He bit his lip. Look, I don't like it, but we're gonna have to rush them before the others show up. You know they're on the way. They'll all be coming since they'll know we got our hands on some weapons. We can't be pinned in this little room. He hesitated and then added, We won't all make it, but it's the only move. He's right. It's the only way to get out of checkmate, Brock agreed. Everyone took a moment to take that in, but then nodded, so Moore counted down from three with his fingers, and at once, everyone rushed out. A hail of bullets flew their way as they ran out onto the deck, opening fire at their outnumbered enemies. Two, one of the crew members and Ballard's geologist, fell dead to the deck, but the mob overwhelmed their attackers quickly. Another of Domina Libertatis' crew fell dead to the deck in the scuffle before it was over. There had been four more of the intruders gathered outside of the control room door after the one more had shot from the doorway. That left potentially 16 more scattered throughout the ship. The group didn't get a chance to catch their breath because shots suddenly rained down on them from the bridge, which was above them. Cover! Moore shouted, and everyone dove behind anything they could that could give them protection. We've got to get up there, another of the ship's crew shouted. He's right, we'll never hit anything from down here, Ballard agreed. We can send out a call for help from the bridge too, Moore added. Okay, half of you take the port stairwell, the rest of us take the starboard. Ballard, lead the port side charge. We should go find the others, one of the Dominia Libertatis' crew shouted as they ducked behind a large container for cover. No, Moore shouted back. I want to as much as you do, but the best bet everyone still alive has is if we get up there and send out a call for help. He's right, Ballard agreed. Now, we've got to move before they call the rest of their merry band of terrorists up here and flank us, Moore added. Once it was decided who would go with who, Moore counted from three, and everyone charged. Up on the bridge, one of the paramilitary unit soldiers was shouting into a handheld radio, Everyone, forget finding those hiding below. Get your asses up on deck now! One of the Pokhetitele Boga troops was waiting to ambush Moore's group at one of the stairwell landings, a little more than halfway up to the bridge. He got one shot off, which hit someone, but wasn't a fatal hit, before Moore, who was in front, returned fire and shot the soldier with a single shot right in his chest. As the mob stormed over him, someone grabbed his gun. Those who didn't have guns were armed with improvised melee weapons they grabbed off the deck. Pipes, bars, or various metal tools, mostly. The two groups charging up the stairwells reached the top at roughly the same time, as the soldiers inside took positions to try and hold the bridge. There were only four of them, and a mob outside. The crew and Ballard's team threw the port and starboard side doors open. The paramilitary troops on the bridge opened fire as the mob rushed inside, those who had guns returning fire. Several people in the rushing mob fell dead from gunshot wounds, but due to having only been given handguns for the mission, and their clips being limited to nine shots, there was very little the soldiers could do to stop the larger mob from overpowering them in seconds with the sheer numbers they had gathered together. The ones who weren't shot by the crew and researchers who had managed to arm themselves with pistols were swarmed by the rest with makeshift weapons and beaten over and over again with metal pipes and rods until they stopped moving. Several of those beating on the bodies didn't stop even then. Not until they were fully satisfied their attackers wouldn't be getting back up again. Not wasting any time now that they had the bridge under control again, more rushed to the helm. The ship's computers and communications had been switched off. One of the intruders must have taken a key from one of the dead officers. Moore slid his key into the helm and turned it in each slot, activating everything back up. He then dove for the sound-powered telephone and spoke into it. To anyone in the crew or Mr. Ballard's team still in hiding on board, stay where you are. We have retaken the bridge and have called for help. Defend yourselves if you need to, but help is on the way. Try to stay hidden until we find you or it gets here. The part about help coming was a lie, but it was a lie with purpose. 
Moore wanted to draw the rest of the intruders out on deck and away from anyone else who was still scattered, hiding and unarmed below deck. He'd bet a year's salary a large number were hidden down in the bottom, deepest most corners of the engine room. That's where he and the crew of his first ship had hid when they were boarded by pirates. And it was likely where the search by their attackers would be the most intense. He then grabbed a radio that was tied into the global maritime distress and safety system and lifted it to his lips, knowing the rest of the merry band of attackers would be coming for the bridge after that announcement. He'd bet a year's salary a large number were hidden down in the bottom, deepest most corners of the engine room. That's where he and the crew of his first ship had hid when they were boarded by pirates. And it was likely where the search by their attackers would be the most intense. He then grabbed a radio that was tied into the global maritime distress and safety system and lifted it to his lips, knowing the rest of the merry band of attackers would be coming for the bridge after that announcement. Mayday, mayday, mayday. This is the Dominia Libertatis. Dominia Libertatis. Dominia Libertatis. We are an unarmed scientific research vessel in international waters. We are under attack by armed individuals of an unknown nationality. Attackers are hostile, armed, and dangerous. Appear to have some degree of military training, possibly a terrorist cell. We are hosting a scientific research mission, and an unknown number of our crew and passengers have been killed, including our captain. This is the ship's first officer, Dylan Moore, speaking. We require immediate assistance. Our coordinates. More than read off the ship's location from one of the nearby navigation screens. As he did, Ballard went to the windows and looked down at the deck. It looked like an ant nest that had been disturbed. There were multiple armed individuals sprinting in their direction. Dylan, there's a bunch of them on deck down there. They're coming this way, Brock called. He wondered if the ones who had been on the bridge had called the others or if Moore's announcement had drawn them out because potentially all that was left of the entire group attacking them, by Moore's count, was rushing along the deck towards the bridge. Repeat, we need immediate assistance, Moore repeated urgently. Dominia Libertitis, this is the United States destroyer John Basseline. We are nearby and en route to your location. A voice suddenly came back over the receiver. Stand by. The response caught Moore a little off guard. Ballard only seemed half surprised. I figured they weren't as far away as they led us to believe, he said, reloading his pistol, tossing the ejected clip off to the side. Everyone with guns reloaded and took cover near the center of the bridge, aiming at both doors, which were again closed and barred as best they could be. Those armed with their makeshift melee weapons crouched out of sight near the doors, ready to ambush anyone who broke inside. We forced them in through the doors. They can't all come in at the doors at once. It's tight. They funnel through two or three at a time. It'll stem how many we deal with on each side at once, and we can force them right into a makeshift kill zone, Moore said trying to get everyone on the same page as they scrambled to get ready for their stand. The paramilitary soldiers made their appearance outside each door not long after. There were 11 of them left, according to Moore's count, and it seemed that his little plot to draw them out had worked because 11 were jostling outside. Five at the port side door, six at the starboard. No one inside fired, but several bullets came flying in through the glass from outside. One of the windows on the starboard side shattered, and one of the soldiers tried to climb inside through the broken window, but was shot several times as those defending that side of the bridge opened fire and tumbled back out. Seemingly having had enough, the two groups coordinated and shot the locks out of both doors with a synchronized hit. As soon as they pushed the doors open and started inside, those on the bridge with guns opened fire at them. Several returned fire, and a few more fell, and as the others tried to rush inside, they were struck over the head, or on their arm holding their weapon, with sudden swift strikes from the rest of the resistance's metal pipes and other handheld weapons. Those struck on the head immediately collapsed, bleeding wounds on their heads, and the ones who felt the metal objects hit their arms also felt their bones shatter in the spot where they hit, and dropped their pistols with cries of pain. The defense didn't stop there. Those with guns kept firing, and those with handheld weapons kept swinging. Even when someone they'd hit was on the ground, they made sure they wouldn't get back up. Moore's plan worked. As the Pokhitetaleboga troops shoved their way inside, they fought to get through the doors on each side of the bridge. Some tripped on the bodies already on the ground, and, 
When the ones left realized they underestimated their prey, they turned to try and escape and regroup. The crew and researchers inside who had guns didn't let up and shot the last ones as they attempted to flee, again stumbling over their fallen comrades in the confined space and fighting to push past one another to get out the door. Meanwhile, the armed crew members of the ship continued to relentlessly fire at them using every last bullet in their pistols. The last Poketitele Boga soldier alive felt several bullets strike him in the back, and he fell just outside of the bridge on the port side stairwell. Then it was over. The last soldier collapsed outside at the top of the stairs on the port side and didn't get up again. His last thought was bitterness, that if their superiors had allowed them to sneak more lethal weapons or even more powerful guns on board, things would have ended much differently than they had. But the commanders were adamant that an unarmed ship could be subdued with only a handful of pistols. They'd been wrong and had put Poket Hitle Boga's troops on an equal footing with the crew and researchers, and the paramilitary unit had lost. Shaking, hesitant, and still fearful, everyone slowly stood up and gazed around. Several of the crew who had joined them had died in the skirmish on the bridge, but Ballard saw no one else on his team had. Though, for all he knew, Sarah, Dave, David, Damien, and the three other researchers standing on the bridge with them might have been the only ones left. Max was gone. He just knew it because he hadn't seen him escape the lab when it all started. And he knew he wouldn't be the only one. Fowler could see the others from his team with him were having similar thoughts, all looking like they were near to breaking down. Dave had unhidden tears in his eyes, welling up there but not running down his face. He blinked them away, but they were quickly replaced. After the shootout, the silence that fell over the bridge was like a curse. It hit with the pressure of the deep sea. When no one else appeared to antagonize the survivors, however, Moore again grabbed the sound-powered phone on the helm and lifted it to his head. This is First Officer Moore. We believe the ship is secure, he said. Those of you left, don't try to come out of your hiding places yet, though. Those of us who are armed are going to search the ship to make sure no one but us are left. The Navy is also on the way. They'll be here soon. Out. He then sighed and looked at Ballard. Brock, you and your team members stay here. Make sure they don't retake the bridge if any are left. Crew members, with me. We're going to search the ship. Leave no corner unchecked, no closet closed, no hatch unsearched. Make sure no more of these guys are on board. And find everyone else. Let's go. Moore ordered, taking charge just like he had when his first ship was attacked by pirates and led the surviving crew members from the bridge to search the ship. Once they were gone, Ballard looked at his team members. Hey, he said, his voice slightly shaking. I get it. But right now, I need you all to hold it together. Trust me, we can all cry later, but right now we need to keep alert just in case there are any more surprises. The others all nodded and slowly dispersed across the bridge somewhat aimlessly. They all looked shell-shocked. Ballard knew he likely did, too. Several thousand feet below them, the unmanned sub which housed the ROV that had gone inside U-116 floated suspended in place, waiting for orders to go up or down. The prototype that had caused all of this still housed within the belly of the ROV tucked up inside its own. It hadn't even reached the sunlit zones of the ocean yet. It still hung completely alone, suspended in a dark void, only penetrated by its beams of light. Moore and his crew were still searching the ship. They had, indeed, found many of the missing members hiding in the bottom of the engine room, along with several members of Ballard's team, including Alex, and were making their way cautiously through the halls towards the kitchen when Ballard's voice came over the ship's intercom. Dylan, you might want to get up on deck. Quickly, the first officer led the others to a stairwell, and they hurried up, running out on deck and stopping. Stunned, because he'd thought they were alone, but it seemed Ballard was right, and that they hadn't been nearly as isolated as they thought. 
It wasn't just one United States Navy ship racing towards them. It was almost enough to call a fleet. Several destroyers were cutting through the water, sleek looking, almost appearing to glide over the ocean surface. The conning tower of a submarine, ironically, was even poking out of the water as well, leaving a long wake behind it. There was even a carrier. Moore didn't know which one, perhaps the Gerald R. Ford, and two jets launched from it, passing over the stricken research vessel seconds later so fast they were nearly impossible to see. Turns out, the Navy wasn't lurking too far away at all. Probably just far enough they could deny their presence being related if it came down to it, Ballard said to the others on the vessel's bridge with him. They had definitely secretly been on standby not far away in case something, perhaps exactly what had happened, happened during the search. It was true. Ballard's guess was right. They had been close to the research ship the entire time, just not close enough to make it obvious. Far enough away to be out of both physical sight and radar detection. The small fleet swooped in and circled around the Dominia Libertatis, and several squadrons of armed soldiers were ferried over to the vessel. They took the crew and passengers on deck off, searched the ship, and found the few still hiding aboard and took them off as well. They were all ferried over to the carrier after being allowed to grab their personal effects, though Ballard and his team had also grabbed their deceased comrades' items too alongside their own. The ruined laptop they left, but pulled the hard drive out in hopes the data could be recovered. Ballard, what was left of his team, and the Dominia Libertatis' crew all could only watch as the Navy took over the mission. After what had happened, they were no longer trying to keep it secret. They were being very obvious. It was an obvious show of strength in response to a punch being thrown. A proportional response, one would say. And what they did surprised everyone. First, they brought the unmanned sub to the surface and retrieved from it what they had been after the entire time. However, they didn't stop there. They started their own salvage operation. They worked through the night and, come the next morning, Ballard and the others came back out on deck in time to witness something incredible. They weren't just stopping with taking the prototype that had been recovered from U-116, and they weren't satisfied with searching the wreck or just knowing where it was. They were taking U-116 too. Nothing was being left behind on the ocean floor, not even the hatch that had been cut off from the U-boat. That was also brought up too. Perhaps out of concern something else might have still been inside the wreck that they didn't know about, anything at all of value or interest that might have still been inside. The Navy crews had worked through the night to attach large inflatable flotation devices to the wreck, anchoring them along the entire length of her deck. They'd blasted the seabed around it with charges to loosen the U-boat and, with cranes and cables far stronger than the ones on the Dominia Libertatis, they were lifting the U-boat. Once the water grew shallow enough that the pressure wouldn't be a concern, the inflatables anchored to the hull were inflated and, combined with the cranes still pulling up, the U-boat easily rose, climbing back out of the depths she had been lost in for so long. Ballard and what was left of his team were on deck the moment that the intact bow of U-116 breached through the surface of the ocean like an erupting volcano. And as the rest of the intact sub slickly slid out of the water and surfaced moments after it, water poured off her and out of the openings in her bow as she resurfaced for the first time in nearly 100 years. It was not the triumphant scene Ballard had always imagined it would be when raising a long-lost wreck. It was bitter. With the help of additional large inflatables that were anchored to her hull once she was brought up, keeping her surfaced, the Navy acted quickly and pumped the water out of the U-boat through the opening in the conning tower Ballard and his team had cut. Once all the water had been drained, she floated much easier and higher in the water, and she was then tethered to one of the destroyers. A team went aboard, and every inch of the U-boat's interior was searched. They took everything from inside, even the personal effects, searching for any other secrets that had still been held inside the wreck. Then, with everything collected, cataloged, and flotation devices still inflated as insurance against an accidental sinking, the fleet set off, 
escorting the Dominia Libertatis, whose crew had been allowed to return to their ship once it was secure and the bodies removed and it was cleared. A squadron of SEALs, however, remained on board in case anyone, or anything, else managed to creep aboard. No one was sure which ship was carrying the artifact, and U-116 was constantly being guarded. Ballard, nor anyone on his team, were allowed to go aboard the U-boat they had found and see it for themselves, though they were told their compensation for this would be that they would receive the full credit for finding and leading the salvage operation of U-116. The Navy was no longer taking chances that the artifact, or U-116 as well, might disappear now that Russia had thrown a poorly disguised punch to try and steal it. One they hadn't, and wouldn't, ever admit to throwing in the first place. To make the whole thing, the Navy raising and towing a near 100-year-old U-boat wreck from World War II back to port in America, less conspicuous, the whole thing was now being promoted. Promoted and sold to the general public as a triumphant raising and recovery of a historical wreck, the solving of a near century old mystery, and that they intended to eventually donate it back to Germany to be converted into a museum ship for everyone to learn from as a sign of continued good faith and friendship between the countries. No one in the public, however, would ever know what U-116 had secretly been carrying on board her when she vanished, though. And what even happened to the prototype itself, Ballard didn't know. He hadn't seen it since it was taken by the Navy right after their arrival. It was all done as quickly and tidy as it seemed, very sudden and clean, the operation over before most of Ballard's team even knew it. The fact the Navy did it so easily and quickly was only further salt to the wounds he and his team and the Dominia Libertatis' crew had all been dealt. They could have just done this themselves from the beginning, and Max and everyone else would still be alive. And even though he knew how the game worked, and that he and his team were expected to be all smiles upon their return for the successful completion of the mission, which they were to pretend they had been in the know of all along, the whole thing didn't sit right with Ballard at all. And it was only made worse by the fact that Max Hall, his best friend, and right-hand man for years, was not next to him, and never would be again. There were more than a mere handful of onlookers who had come to see U-116's arrival in New York Harbor. As the destroyer towing her arrived, multiple civilian boats of varying kind and size passed by as close as they could, their occupants all gazing at the old submarine. On the ports, boardwalks, and shore of the harbor, people were also gathered, it seemed the city had also gone out of its way to make an event out of the arrival, just like the Navy had. To add to the spectacle, the destroyer even gave several loud horn blasts to get people excited to see the remarkable recovery, as the media had been putting it. Ballard and his team were back on the Dominia Libertatis, which was following the destroyer and U-116 into the harbor, being praised as the ship which found the wreck, led by a man who had found it when no one else ever could have. For the cameras, Ballard had put a smile on his face, and so were the remaining members of his team that were on deck with him, taking in the praise from the public they felt wasn't earned. An old fantasy of Ballard's had been to raise and tow a wreck back into port and give it new life, probably an influence from watching Raise the Titanic too many times as a kid. That movie had been to him what Jurassic Park had been to future paleontologists. But it wasn't like this that he had ever expected that old dream to come to fruition. No one in the public were aware of the attack on the Dominia Libertatis, and her crew and Ballard's team had all had new, non-disclosure agreements put in front of them before they arrived in port. They felt like they got a new one with each meal they'd had since the incident. Ballard had not heard from the general, he had half expected it, half expected him to never acknowledge their agreement and what transpired again, but he had been told that the president was in the process of breaking the news to the leaders of the countries who had lost people in the attack. A cover story for the United States populace being written would claim pirates had swooped in during the operation to attempt and steal the U-boat for scrap and the equipment on the ship to sell, but the Navy had forced them away, regrettably after a few deaths had occurred. Finally, after what felt like far too long of an event, 
of the U-boat being shown off before she was moored in port, Ballard, his team, and First Officer Moore disembarked from the freshly docked Dominia Libertatis at the same pier that they'd first boarded her on. Her owners were in a frenzy. Having also been informed, many individuals on their payroll had been killed in a pirate attack, and lawsuits were no doubt going to be coming from the families. The United States, and in secret their allies and the countries who had lost people, knew it was a Russia paramilitary organization, but the public story was a pirate attack. Russia knew they were aware too, and had kept their heads down, not acknowledging the attack. They knew the rest of the world would pounce if they tried to offer sympathy for the dead, claim they were unaware of the attack, or that it wasn't from their own supposedly sponsored paramilitary organization. Ballard loved the sea. He loved searching it, but today it felt good to have solid ground under his feet again and not have it miles down underwater. He sat his bags down on the ground and faced his team. Good job, everyone. Drinks at the hotel are on me tonight. Whatever you need is on me tonight, okay? Everyone nodded and silently sauntered off. But Ballard held back and looked around, looking at U-116 one final time. Her rusty red hull made her easy to spot. She still gave off nothing when he looked at her. No vibe or feeling to read. She was still as lifeless as she had been when they found her. Ballard noticed there was no feeling of sadness or loneliness or that she'd let her crew down or even the more rare welcoming aura a wreck gave off from her at all. She truly was dead. She died with her crew in 1942, he told himself, before turning his gaze to more. There she is. A wreck no more. He paused and shook his head. It's like it didn't matter. They could have done it themselves. They tried to play the game first. Good people died because of that. Good friends died because of that, Ballard said. I almost don't want their money. You'd be an idiot not to take it. I know it can't replace lost friends, but you told me how much you're going to get for this job. And you can bet your bottom dollar they're going to give you more to make sure you keep quiet. Take it. Use it for what you love. For good. For finding lost pieces of history and solving the mysteries of them. Don't let this take that from you. Don't let that passion wither, Moore said. Ships like the Lord Spencer would have never been found and been forgotten about because no one would look for them. But because of you can see them again, enjoy them, and learn their stories. Don't let that passion, that fire, get quenched. Ballard looked at him. Since when did you turn into Shakespeare? Moore laughed. <laughs> at least you can do that kind of thing. Most I'll get is promoted to captain of the Dominia Libertatis. She's a good ship. Far better than you'd think when she first meets the eyes. And she couldn't ask for a better man to take her helm, Ballard replied. We'll use her again someday, on another hunt. Maybe to put a name to some ships I know about but remain unidentified. Ballard held out a hand to Moore. Keep in touch, he said. Moore smiled, despite the somber mood Ballard's team and his crew had been all but drowning in, and shook it. Heck yeah. You got more stories you said you'd tell me. He paused, took a deep breath, and added... I'm happy to have known you. I'll visit you in Ohio sometime. Where's bumfuck on the map? Never heard of that town you grew up in. That got Ballard to chuckle. <laughs> I'll point it out on a map, he mused as they shook hands. A firm shake, sealing their new friendship, and they parted company. Just for the time being. They both knew they'd see each other again soon. As Brock Ballard left the pier, leaving U-116, and the celebration of her recovery behind, Operation Baltic Sea Anomaly was officially closed. Two weeks after the incident, it was now the first week of November. Brock Ballard was sitting in his living room back home in Ohio. 
he wanted to take some time off the ocean to gather his thoughts about the whole incident. The sudden, ruthless attack they'd been hit with when totally unprepared for even the possibility. If the Navy suspected it might happen, they sure hadn't hinted at it. And he told his team to do the same as him, and they'd meet up again the next year when the government sent the blank check they'd promised and reassured would come after the unfortunate incident that had occurred. As predicted, they'd been quick to assure him he was still going to be paid as agreed. Some members of his team were handling the whole thing well. Dave, David, and Damien all seemed to be doing the best out of everyone, already back to their old selves save when moments of sadness crept into their faces. Alex was doing better than he had been two weeks ago, but was still going through the grief and nightmares. Sarah was having a hard time, the hardest of everyone. She and Max had been close friends, almost like siblings. U-116 was currently still docked in New York Harbor, and after being thoroughly checked again and anything missed inside during her first search was taken out, it was deemed the public would be allowed to view and tour the vessel. Tours were happening every day. Schools had booked field trips, in some cases back-to-back -back ones. Documentary teams were coming to the sub. A filmmaker announced he wanted to make a movie about the U-boat's last voyage and announced a script was already being written. In the investigation of the wreck, before U-116 was open to the public, it was also determined by the government team that handled it that the most probable explanation for her disappearance was that she indeed suffered a total mechanical failure and sank, flooding while she did and dropping like a rock to the ocean floor, trapping everyone inside. No other secret weapons or additional components of the prototype weapon had been found on board her. An agreement had also been made with Germany that the United States would keep her for a year before she would be taken to her home port again where she would stay. The news was on in the background and Ballard was half paying attention to what the reporter was saying. She was talking about another unknown animal sighting in the state's national forest and showing a supposed video someone took that looked more like a teaser for a new Jurassic Park movie. It was something that had seemingly become a trend lately because it had been a more and more frequent story for weeks by this point, each time a new account or video was shared. Today, the newsreel scrolling along the bottom of the screen read, Dinosaur sightings becoming more and more common. Widespread internet hoax or perhaps something more. Ballard was half convinced the reports had to be some kind of marketing stunt for a new dinosaur or monster movie of some kind or that it was just a more realistic than usual ARG that someone or a group of people had been creating that was fooling people into believing it was real. With all the grainy video clips, dash cam footage, and admittedly very real looking nighttime game camera pictures that were being reported on, it had to be that, he was distractedly telling himself when he got another phone call. He heard his phone buzz on the table and picked it up, put the phone to his ear, and heard the same general on the other end who had called him originally. Mr. Ballard, he said. Yeah, Brock confirmed. In exchange for your services to your government, you and your team will receive the full 10 years of funding for archaeological research and expeditions, along with an additional five years of funding as an apology for the incident that occurred during your service to us. Thank you, Ballard stiffly replied. Part of him not wanting it, but he knew better than to refuse it. He'd never receive a chance like this again. Full funding for even his wildest searches. He would now be able to look into the most obscure mysteries that he wanted to investigate. He knew Max would have wanted him to keep doing what he loved. He would have wanted the team to keep doing what they loved. Searching the ocean, finding lost ships, and putting answers where there were once mysteries. Ballard still had that same passion for it, but he also would be doing it in honor of his friend and other team members who had died now. It was for them as much as it was for his own love of it. He went to hang up, but then brought the phone back to his ear. Hey, he said into it. A moment later, the general's voice came back. He likely had been about to hang up as well. Yes, he said. Did the device work? Ballard asked. The general was silent for a moment, 
and Ballard didn't expect him to answer. But then, perhaps feeling Ballard deserved to know, he spoke again. It was too damaged to be of any potential use, the general said. The outside of the device was intact, but the delicate systems of gears and mirrors inside were destroyed after being underwater for nearly a hundred years. We haven't been able to successfully reverse engineer it either. What's left inside is simply too corroded and brittle. So it was all for nothing, Ballard said. Yes, the general replied after a moment of silence. Ballard clenched his jaw. He wanted to scream at the man. Thank you, he simply said again after a moment, hanging up. Maybe tomorrow he would start planning his next expeditions. First, to the SS Neuronic, then to the USS Bory, and then a long overdue trip back to the unknown iron steamship waiting for him on the ocean floor. Dylan would be excited to be there for that one. Maybe, without having to worry about funding running out or putting his team in danger like that again, though nothing could bring back Max and the others who were lost, all he could and would do was honor them, and getting back there was what they would have wanted, he could finally spend enough time at the wreck, which was a mystery to them both, to do more than just shine lights on the wreck, but never gotten to truly give the attention it, and others, that they deserved. His mystery ship was one of just many out there waiting for him, but that would be the first he'd finally solve. He could finally spend as much time there as he needed to unlock her story, shine light into its dark windows again, and maybe now he could finally give it back its identity. He wouldn't stop until he knew who that ship was. Surveys of the Neuronic and the Bory first, then he would go solve that mystery, and then many more, and find other lost wrecks with more mysteries and stories to tell while doing so. With that in mind, he placed the phone back down on the table.